Good morning. Hi, everybody. My name is Adrian Birmingham, and I had the pleasure of being the director of TEDx Buffalo this year. Um, I'd like to welcome you all to Canisius for the fourth annual TEDx Buffalo. In just a few minutes, you're going to be learning more about TED and TEDx from our Master of Ceremonies. But first, I wanted to explain why we chose this year's theme, In Motion. Last year, we recognized our city's renaissance by presenting TEDx Buffalo Renaissance Citizens. This year's theme builds on last year's. Now that we've acknowledged our city's renaissance, it's time to recognize those who are hard at work bringing about positive change in our community, those who are truly in motion. Each of you were chosen to join us today because the TEDx Buffalo Committee sensed that you too were in motion in Western New York. Thank you for helping us fill this room with positive energy today as we broadcast our impressive speaker's ideas beyond these walls. I'd like to take a moment to recognize our sponsors, without whom this event and all of the great things that come after would not be possible. Damon Mori, the Canisius College Women's Business Center, Cinecor, Select One Search, Infotech, Babalu Ventures, Black Squirrel Distillery, Comdoc, West Her Auto Group, Fairy Cakes Cupcakery, Buffalo Business First, Block Club, Seneca Buffalo Creek Casino, Lloyd Taco Truck, Oogie Games, Future Self Productions, B Team Buffalo, You and Who, and Canisius College. I'd also like to thank all of you for being here because your energy today will fuel the speakers on stage and will motivate us TEDx Buffalo organizers to continue bringing TEDx Buffalo to life. Now, before you meet our Master of Ceremonies and before you meet today's speakers, I'd like to appeal to each one of you. Every once in a while, you have a conversation with someone that stays with you long after you've walked away. Sometimes it's what the person said to you or what they taught you. Sometimes it's just the way that they said it, a new way to explain something you'd always wondered about. After having these types of conversations, you might find yourself wondering, if I found a group of people who agreed with this, then I could do this. Or, if I knew other people thought what I thought, I might feel empowered to speak up. Those moments of wonder and inspiration are what lead to great action and innovation. Our peers are our most powerful motivators and our sturdiest support system. Today, we're doing away with chance. Instead of wondering when your next great conversation will be, we're promising you at least 12 of them. We're here to spread ideas. You know, ideas worth spreading. Though maybe vague, this concept is absolutely why I'm here. It's not so much the noticeable waves I'm interested in creating today. It's the small rumbling of one person realizing one thing that somewhere down the line rolls into a great wave of change. I hope today's talks make you uncomfortable and curious and confident and courageous. Now, I'd like to introduce today's Master of Ceremonies. Jacob Alberella has been acting professionally for the past 10 years. He has done short films, features, commercials, improv comedy, and is a four-time Art Voice Artie nominee for his work on stage. Some notable projects of his include Avenue Q and Tommy at Musical Fair Theater, A Year with Frog and Toad with the Theater of Youth, and Cannibal the Musical. Jacob is also co-founder and manager of the House of Munch food truck, which serves fried dough, birch beer, and other carnival treats. House of Munch is just one of many delicious restaurants currently in motion in Buffalo. Please help me welcome Jacob Alberella. Thank you very much. Good morning. So, I'm very excited, thank you Adrian and the TEDx Buffalo team for having me here to MC the event today. It's a very exciting event and I think you're all gonna have a ton of fun today. So by a show of hands, who's been to a TED or a TEDx event before? Quite a few of you, that's awesome. And who has not? Awesome. Me neither, I'll admit. But that's okay, because we, we've got great speakers, who are here to share some awesome, awesome ideas with everyone. 
So who is this TED guy? TED is a nonprofit organization. Um, it's devoted to, like Adrian said, ideas worth sharing. It started as a four-day conference in California 25 years ago and has grown to support these world-changing ideas with multiple initiatives around the world. And in that same spirit, TEDx is a program of local and self-organized events that bring people together to share a TED-like experience. At TEDx events, TED Talk video and live speakers combine to spark deep discussion and connection in a small group. And these local self-organized events are branded TEDx, where X is an independently organized TED event. So uh, throughout the day, we're going to have multiple chances to share those ideas with each other. Uh, we're, of course, going to have a lunch break around 12 o'clock, and we're going to have a couple 20-minute breaks where we can get up and stretch our legs and um, share some ideas and, and use the restrooms if we need to. Of course, the restrooms are in the front of the building. Uh, men's room is to your left, women's room to your right. And in the unlikely circumstance that we need to use emergency exits, there's one on either side of the stage and one in the front of the building as well. Uh, food and beverages will be served until it runs out throughout the day. And there's a great variety of food, but if anyone needs anything other than what we have for health reasons, please let one of our TED organizers in the white t-shirts know and we'll do our best to accommodate you. Um, TED, unfortunately, strictly prohibits photography, especially flash photography, because we have our TEDx hired photographers. There are the ninjas scattered around the area right now, and they're going to be doing a great job posting um, on our TEDx official social media sites, and uh, so they'll be doing that throughout the day. So in that regard, please do our speakers and performers a courtesy while they're up here, and try not to post to your social media or pull out your phone and tweet or anything like that because we're going to be um, doing that throughout the day as well. So uh, try not to have your phones out when they're doing their thing. And how's everyone feeling? Really, we have a very exciting day planned today. I mean, just look at the space that we're in. Is this beautiful or what? So, yes, absolutely. This year, TEDx Buffalo has expanded to accommodate 300 attendees for free, thanks to our numerous sponsors that Adrian mentioned before. That's up from about 100 from last year. And TEDx Buffalo has taken place each October right here in Montante Cultural Center since 2011. And we couldn't have done this without the help of Canisius College, and particularly the president of President of Canisius, President John J. Hurley, and I would like to pass the mic to him right now. Thank you, Thank you very much, Jacob, and welcome to all of you to, to the uh, Canisius College campus and to this Montante Cultural Center. You know, over the last 20 years, we've done about $170 million in capital improvements on the Canisius campus right here in the heart of the city of Buffalo. We've called this place home since 1870, and we've really sunk our roots deeply into this city neighborhood right here in central Buffalo. I think of all the projects, though, the one I like best is this Montante Cultural Center. We took this parish, it was the St. Vincent de Paul Parish, built in about 1926-27. At that time, the second, the second parish, uh, Catholic parish on Main Street, after St. Louis down at Maine and Edward. So as we, the city began to push eastward, uh, this was the next stop. The college acquired this building in the mid 80s and it stayed uh, laid out as a church until the late 90s when we reimagined it as a 500 seat performing arts center. And you can see the beautiful results of creative thinking and a little bit of money. Um, the building is an interesting bridge, I think, between what has been and what can be. The stained glass windows, these were all intact when we acquired the building, they're original. They remind us of what has been. These sound baffles up above you uh, to, uh, to uh, muffle the sound from the domes in the building are an example of what can be in, in this kind of space. 
And indeed, it's your theme for today's conference, In Motion, that I think captures this essence of this transition or being on a bridge from what has been to what can be. You know, you look all across the city and across our region, and we're seeing the results of new ways of thinking, creative approaches, and new ideas that are driving Buffalo and Western New York from what has been to what can be. We see it in neighborhoods, in, in, in the Elmwood Village, on Hurdle Avenue, at Harbor Center, down on the Webster Block in downtown Buffalo, at Canal Side, at Buffalo Niagara Medical Campus, all over the region, people are reimagining what has been here in this region and what can be. And it's not just institutions, or it's not just neighborhoods and places, it's institutions like Canisius College. Respecting the tradition in the past of what has been since 1870 and understanding that we needed to move from what has been, which was a local college serving only Western New York to a regional comprehensive university engaging students across the nation, across the world, taking advantage of online and digital technologies to spread our message around the world and to bring people here to Buffalo, both uh, virtually and, and in person, to show off what we have here. We are in the midst of making that transition from what has been to what can be. You know, higher education is probably the best example of taking young people from what they've been and, and trying to convince them of what they can be. I want to tell you a story about a, uh, an initiative that the Jesuits are involved in. We are a Jesuit college. That's an order of Catholic priests uh, dating back to the mid-16th century. One of our works, it's a, it's a worldwide network of about 18,000 men engaged in the service of the church. One of their very important works is the Jesuit refugee services, working in refugee camps in Africa and in Asia. We've got a new initiative called Jesuit Commons Higher Education at the Margins, in which we're offering online education to refugees in camps in Asia and Africa, taking them on a sequence of courses and awarding them certificates if they complete. I got a report last week about the success of this project, and there was a testimonial from a young man in Malawi who said he had completed a six-course uh, sequence, got all A's and B's, and he earned his certificate. And so when he got the certificate, the certificate was issued by one of our colleges, Regis College out in Denver. He took that certificate and he went to the university in Africa and tried to enroll with that certificate. And they wouldn't recognize the certificate because they hadn't approved the curriculum. And he, and he wrote, that's no problem. Because what I need to do is not amaze people with my credentials, but amaze people with the knowledge that I've received. And isn't that the challenge for all of our students in higher education in the United States? I continually tell our students, don't get so focused on the credential. This is about a process. This is about acquiring knowledge. We are, after all, not so much in the degree-granting business at Canisius, but we are in the knowledge business. And we've got a lot of knowledge to spread. That's our mission in the world. And we need to infuse our students with a sense of passion and, 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 a, and a sense of going for it and, and trying to understand and to grab all the knowledge that they can. I tell them again and again, because you all know it in this room, there's no better time than when you're young to immerse yourself in great books and great ideas. So immerse yourself today here on, your cam on our campus. We're, we're thrilled to have you here. I'm glad the weather was good. I'm glad the parking was good. Um, enjoy your day. Think about great ideas and spread them around the world as we're doing here at Canisius College. All the best to you. I got to just center the red dot here. Very important part of TED. So, everyone ready for our first speaker? Yes! I am. So, you notice behind me a big movie screen, big projection screen. Movie theaters project images on a rectangle screen. 
right in front of us, much like this one. But our next speaker, Keith Harrington, or Project, can't be contained by rectangles. Using light mapping and more than 10 years, <laughs> using light mapping and more than 10 years audiovisual experience, Projects creates experiences using sound, light, and projection, using the space all around us. Let's get right to it. I present Keith Harrington, the projectionist. I've always been intrigued with transforming environments. I remember a time when I was a kid. There were seven of us living in a cramped two-bedroom apartment. My three brothers and I shared a bedroom, and my two sisters had the other bedroom. Our mother was sleeping on a couch after her third of many divorces. She was doing the best she could to keep the family together. Each time we'd move, my brothers and I would choose our new bunks. It seemed like the upper was always the most sought after. This time, I got the lower. So, being a resourceful kid, I did the best I could and uh, decided to make the most out of that six by three foot space the only place in the world I could call my own. So I got a hold of some wood and built a shelving unit. On it, I had a tube television, cassette deck, tapes, and my most prized possessions. It was a transformed space. So fast forward several years. I graduated from high school and was working on an uh, art degree. I had moved immediately out of the house and was juggling a full-time job. But without a strong foundation, things started to unravel. As you can imagine, it's not e easy putting yourself through school at that age. So there were mounting financial pressures and eventually I got evicted from my apartment. I ended up getting caught up in the rave scene and spent a lot of time at underground nightclubs and crashing on my friend's apartment that fall. But even when times are tough, there's always a potential for a positive change. You see, one of those underground clubs had an interesting setup. They had a television in the background and they were always showing movies, even while the DJs played music. I thought to myself, wouldn't it be cool to take this to the next level? Yeah, just like that. <laughs> <laughs> Why not take the tube television and make it part of the DJ mix? This idea really inspired me so much that I had to make it happen. So I got my life back on track, and within a few years, I was cutting and scratching records and incorporating video directly into the mix. This was all being done with, VH with analog equipment. VHS tapes, final records, tube televisions, a line would come out of the VCR into the DJ mixer and be create something completely new and unique. Technology has evolved, and 25 years after that boy who watched TV and played cassettes in his bunk, I'm now transforming and performing music and visuals for hundreds, sometimes thousands. Audio and visual performance can certainly alter venues, but there's even something bigger that is inspiring me these days. The past few years, I have been using video projection to transform spaces. Oftentimes, these spaces are environments that are abandoned and neglected, and the installations are temporary. But see, 
there's always potential for a positive change. This is a space that I recently worked in with fellow artists Jeremy Maxwell and Daniel Green. These are old industrial furnaces that were used to roast barley on a place called Silo City. Artists were given the opportunity to make site-specific installations during the event, and it was called City of Night. They, the way we decided to interpret this portion of the space was by creating an interactive viewer experience, and it would touch on extreme climate change and global warming. It was called Califactor. People could walk up to the oven and using a controller, increase or decrease the relative temperature of the planet. As they did this, they would see the effect they were having inside the ovens, reshaping the globe from the ice age conditions to the future when the polar ice caps have melted and part of our world is underwater. More than 10,000 people attended this event, and each one of them could have walked away with their own vision on how to reuse those furnaces. The possibilities are endless. Another unique way of ins inspiring way, another inspiring way to use projections is by temporarily changing landscape. This time, I transformed an ordinary object that was, which people would typically just drive by and not even think about, a water tower. The folks at Buffalo Art Studio approached me with the initial concept and developed the idea into a video installation with me for a biannual fundraiser called Tarmania. I animated the three-eyed cat-like monster that would pop up out of the water tower, blink a few times, and then disappear again. It was kind of like a groundhog, only way cooler. <laughs> I, <laughs> it was a beacon that could be seen far off in the distance the night of the event, briefly reshaping the area. Now, people usually think you just turn on a projector and then bam, there you have it. Just ask the people at TED here. <laughs> but projecting a two-dimensional image onto a three-dimensional surface is not all easy. For starters, the area to be projected on has to be mapped. This is the act of identifying the elements on the object that will be lit by the projector and calculating their depth and shape from the point of the projector itself. If not done carefully, the projected images will be distorted and excess light will bleed over onto the surrounding areas, totally ruining the effect. There are almost always other obstacles to overcome. For this particular project, we had the lettering on the tower which needed to be covered. This required an insured contractor. The animation itself needed to be mapped in order to fit on the architectural elements of the tower itself. The weather that week was so cold and rainy, absolutely miserable. The winds were so high that they actually flat flattened the tent that the, housed the projector the night before the event, but we did what we had to do and we just made it happen. Now, I would like to plant this seed in all of your minds. If given the opportunity to transform that water tower, what would you have done? What would you have created? Here's another chance I had to transform a space. Last year, Buffalo played host to the Bali Conference. It was a national organization that helps promote local economies Hundreds came to Western New York to take part. For our city on the rise, it was exciting. Many of us saw the opportunity to showcase Buffalo and our region. We wanted to impress. So I thought, 
If you are in Western New York, then what must you see? Niagara Falls, of course. But <laughs> these guys were all on tight schedules, and they didn't have time to get up there to see the falls, likely. So I decided to bring the falls to them. I worked with local organizers, and uh, we found a building that was ideal for this location in the vicinity of the gala. Then we created an artistic representation of Niagara Falls flowing over the building. In doing so, we highlighted one of the natural wonders of the world and the beauty our region has to offer, not to mention a renewable energy that's been tapped into for more than a century. All this through introducing temporary reuse of an exterior space. That was my take on it. Anyway. So, when I began to de develop this talk, I thought to myself, I would love to light map on a building for you. But we're obviously indoors, so that's not an option. What I've done instead was create this model. So, here you go, lights. That video piece opened with some rare footage from the 1901 Pan American Exposition, or the World's Fair. It took place here in Buffalo and became known as the City of Light. At the time, Buffalo was the eighth largest city in the U.S. and had booming industries like steel production and the grain elevators. People were in awe because the hydroelectricity used to power the magnificent light displays was being powered by Niagara Falls 25 miles away. About 8 million people attended the fair, and most of them had never even seen a light bulb before. Much like the installations and projections that I'm inspired to create, the majority of the buildings made for the Pan American Exposition were only temporary. They had been constructed out of a plaster fiber material that was intended to fade away. There are a lot of underlying similarities here, like the highs and the lows that incur in all of our lives. The same has happened with this city, and Buffalo is on the rise again. With that in mind, look up, because I've transformed this space for you. Anyway, <laughs> see, 
Each and every one of us has the power to transform the places we live, no matter how temporary or permanent. In your own way, it makes a difference. And with that change, you'll inspire a movement. Remember, always think big and dream even bigger, even if things don't work out on the technical side. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, Keith. So Keith didn't warn me that the lights were going to go out beforehand, and I get a little bit scared of the dark. I, I will, I'm not afraid to admit it. And uh, I'm also not, too afraid, uh, not afraid to admit it's because of zombies. I, I, I wasn't joking. Uh, I, I wonder what I would do if zombies were ever to come out from the woodwork and just start taking over. On a completely unrelated note, Ambra Saltzbaugh has a background in communications and language study, which she has enriched with her experiences living and working abroad, moving back and forth from California, New York, France, and Italy over the past 15 years. And maybe she can help me with my completely reasonable fear. I now present Ambra Saltzbaugh with her talk, Survive the Apocalypse by Learning Italian. Ambra? Thank you. Good morning, everybody. So, since my talk is titled Survive the Apocalypse by Learning Italian, I thought I'd let you know I, I've never worked at the CDC. I don't know that much about apocalypse. What I do know about is something I have about 20 years experience in, which is languages. I'm a Native American, so I grew up learning English. And then I learned French in school. I learned Italian through immersion. And I'm currently learning Spanish on my smartphone. So it doesn't matter how you learn languages, I'm a big fan. My background is also in communication and media studies. So I'm always exploring new ideas on how all of these things come together as far as education, language, and my other favorite subject more recently in my life, strategy. So in order to talk about strategy, I thought we could talk about survival, because we can all relate to it, and we're all just a little bit obsessed by it right now. Anywhere you look in the media, and all of the multiple forms of media that we have right now, you can see dramatizations, video games, books, comic books, television shows, movies, earthquakes, floods. Some of these things actually do happen, of course, especially the natural disasters. Plague, nuclear war, aliens, all of these things, and tabloids. Everywhere you look, especially now more than ever, even though it's been an obsession for the human race since our inception, including the beginning of the world, we talk about the end of the world. But right now, it's really consuming our entire environment. So with this list, there's one that stands out to me as a particular favorite of ours right now, which is, of course, zombies. So since I am obsessed by language, and I am obsessed by strategy, and I know that we are all obsessed by zombies, I thought we could look through the lens of zombies and survival in a zombie apocalypse to talk about strategy and how we can develop our strategic mind through language. So first, on the media end of things, I wanted to relate it a little bit back to how does survival and these apocalyptic, apocalyptic situations combine, other than if you're actually in an apocalyptic situation and you do need to survive, in the real world, in real time, we actually approach these subjects and get obsessed by them because we're trying to survive right now. This little chart will show you um, just movie production. That's the only media that it represents from the early stages of movie making till the present time. And over this past almost century, there's been some different spikes in zombie movie making, but you can see especially more recently. Nonetheless, every time there's a spike, sociologists have 
correlated it to other extreme stressful and anxiety inducing uh, societal things like for example the big spike that you see there was right around at the time of the Iraq war so sometimes it might have to do with other diseases and whatnot and so we use zombies among other things but in this case zombies cathartically to deal with that kind of anxiety and our fear so to simplify all of that to move on to the next phase of the talk what I've basically surmised is that the way we try to deal with fear the most is by scaring ourselves even more. And aside from being fearful, what we want to do is be prepared. So there's a whole other movement right now. You'll see, if, I don't know if any of you are familiar, but on YouTube, cable TV, reality television shows, we are terming people preppers. Anybody familiar with preppers? Yeah, okay. So they, I'm not, it's not just my obsession, they are <laughs> pervasive as I perceive. Preppers basically will teach us survival skills like what to store in your pantry, how to keep water and keep it clean for a long time, how to train your family in first aid, how to create a bunker in a lost plant um, of land somewhere that you might buy, things that are less extreme, more extreme, how to use weaponry, Nonetheless, it all takes place on what you see on the left side of the screen here, which is what I call the tools or the usefulness side. These are all things that we need to survive. We need them. And what they really do for us is they make sure that we don't die, right? Survival actually has two components. It's not just not dying. It's surviving strategically through stress, through a stressful situation. So. We need to develop that part of ourselves as well, not just stock our bug out bag, our trunk, the trunks of our cars, our basements, our bunkers, our attics, and whatever remote locations we might have set up for ourselves in the case of an apocalypse. We need to be adaptable, strategic. We need to be resourceful, rational. We need to be brave, creative. These are all things that we need to develop in ourselves constantly to live not only a good, healthy life, but a life that we're surviving very well while we're living it before and if ever an apocalypse were to come along. So the next thing I wanted to talk about is risk. Before we talk about this slide, what I wanted to ask is if you guys wouldn't mind participating in a little personal risk assessment. Raise your hand for me, please, if you have ever gotten yourself out of a situation using tactics like running, so that would be changing jobs or moving towards something, changing your home, changing a relationship, talking through something, or maybe using violence, or allowing yourself to be hurt, money, paying your way through something, Everyone's raising their hand because we've all used different tactics in real life to survive and get through stressful situations or when we need to make a change and move on to something else. In business, we do things a little like this. This is a very simple version. It can become very complex, but this gets the idea across. We'll do things like identify risk, you analyze risk, you monitor risk, you implement a plan, you go back around, it's cyclical, any step can be engaged at any time. It's kind of dry <laughs> and meant to be predictable and meant for long-term success. Usually it's used for things that have high stakes, monetary involvement, or other kinds of damage, like maybe you're building a bridge and you need to study all kinds of high stakes situations for that. Um, I don't know anyone who runs their life this way. Maybe I know one person who runs their life this way. Anyone here run their life this way? No. I've known most people to run their life this way, um, whether or not they're doing it consciously or not, but we hit walls, we turn right, we turn left, we go backwards. Eventually, we might come out the other end. We might stay in one corner a really long time, wonder why, why did we stay there so long? Well, what I realized when I became really interested in risk management is that most people, not businesses, but people don't understand risk. We're not taught risk management at all on a personal level. 
we don't grow up learning about making strategic choices. We might get a script of what to do with our lives, but we don't understand why we're doing it. We might rebel, depending on your personality. We don't know why. We don't know what the end point necessarily is or how we're going to get there or what if something changes in the meantime. So that's where strategy comes in. When I realized that there wasn't a lot out there for people to learn about risk on a personal level, I became interested in gambling. Because gambling kind of arches the spectrum between someone obsessively trying to beat the odds at a game and understand it. So that's kind of like risk management. And then the whole other end of that spectrum is hope and trust. But hope isn't a strategy. It's not. So moving from back to front so we can get to survival, strategy, and language, I want to talk about the left side and the right side of the brain, not from a neuroscience point of view, but from a categorical point of view. You'll see some big similarities between this list and the list I showed previously, the usefulness side, what we think of as useful, tactical things that we can use functionally, and then other more contextual, imaginative, whole-minded sorts of ways of going about doing things. So. If you look on the left, you'll see language. And we typically think of language as a functional thing. Human beings have this amazing gift of language, but when we learn it, not natively, but when we learn something in a school, usually, in my experience, it's been, you know, in around high school, you start learning this functional thing. You have nouns, you have verbs, you have syntax, grammar, it's boring not that interesting and you don't really understand the point and we're not really engaging in that learning situation the whole picture of the benefits of language when you start using language and you start living language maybe that's traveling or through work or even just through your community because God knows every community has plenty of opportunities to speak different languages we just may not engage in them some of the things that you can learn usually not by osmosis, but in every contextual situation, gradually, as you branch out. So you learn how to say a sentence, or you learn how to read a sentence, or identify words. But once you start putting them together, a simple little bit that you learn turns into something a little bit more complex, and a little bit more complex, and you start seeing the world a little bit differently. You start understanding how to approach problem solving a little bit differently. And what you see here are some of those resources that you build deep in your mind that have nothing to do with actually speaking the language at hand. So you become rational, you become very aware of what's going on because you have to absorb everything to learn anything. Um, you become very self-sufficient. Dictionaries can only do so much for you. Um, and very adaptable, of course, which is our best human muscle that we engage in. One of my main experiences that really convinced me of language being a really good teacher of strategy and survival is I had the opportunity to, uh, to teach for a year in Italy three-year-old Italians in immersion style English for a year. So this means that for a good portion of their day, five days a week, these three-year-olds, who were just barely getting a handle on their own language, but we're all about comfort, right, at this age. Everything is about the world is being given to you, shown to you, just as it is. And then you get put in school, and everything's totally shaken up. You just start to think you've got a handle on things, and someone's speaking a language that you don't even understand. So, of course, Screaming Kids, it developed over the year. It was a massive success. I, I couldn't be prouder of that experience. I witnessed in these little children their total vulnerability because young children are not afraid to be vulnerable. I witnessed their ability to really just look outside of themselves because they don't have a strong identity built yet where we feel we can only do things one way. And there only is one way, right? So as you learn, and I've experienced this myself, I only started learning languages in junior high school and beyond, but what I did learn over 20 years of doing so is those skills that I developed were very similar to what they were doing, but 
in a very natural, sort of easy way. Even if it was a little bit forced upon them, they were very welcoming of it. And I saw those differences. So the next thing I wanted to bring back around to this whole survival aspect is what do we expect from survival? Do we expect just adaptation, which is our great skill? Do we expect to be able to pick something up and make it work for us? Do we expect to just not die? What do we want when we're obsessing over things like the zombie apocalypse? Do we just want some catharsis, some comfort? I think deeply we want to make sure that we're going to get through it, whatever it is in our present life. We're going to move through each and everything that we encounter. And so when we think of things like human evolution, it's now. Your evolution is now, every single day. We're not just part of a, a broad evolution. You're part of your individual evolution. It's never too late to start developing those strategic skills to make sure that you move forward in your life in a way that will get you exactly where you want to go. And it happens fast when you start thinking that way. When you're not going through the labyrinth and figuring out and taking two years to do something that you could do in six months just because you thought about it a little bit more or because your strategic muscles were stronger. So <laughs> we all know, let's be honest, that I didn't really come here to talk about zombies. We know this. Um, I'm not a zombie expert, and um, there are many people who are. <laughs> Though I thought it was a great way to get your attention because I do think survival and strategy are very inter intertwined, and I think language and strategy are very intertwined. So I think that in some way or another, we can use language to survive the apocalypse. Um, what I want to finish with on for this talk with you is when you learn a language, you learn a skill, you learn something that maybe you can use. If you're telling someone that you're going to start learning Mandarin or maybe Spanish, what will they say? Great! That's good. You know why? Because they perceive it as useful. If you tell someone that you're going to start learning Turkish or Dutch or Italian, they ask why. Because <laughs> it doesn't seem like it's that useful. It doesn't seem like you might get very little opportunity to use it, and gosh, that's a lot of effort. But it doesn't matter what language you learn. It just matters that you use it, that you're passionate about it, and that you really engage with it completely. Learning languages doesn't just expand the amount of people you can talk to. It completely transforms you. Thank you. Thank you, Ambra. So they're just going to scoot some stuff off the stage while I'm talking. Pay no attention to the man behind the curtain. So this past year, I had the very great privilege to be cast in a local production of The Who's Tommy, which is widely, widely considered uh, one of the best rock operas, probably of all time. Um, and definitely the first mainstream one. So since then, there's been just... a uh, rock operas all over the place in, in many different capacities. And our next speaker, Sabrina Pena Young, has spent her time collaborating with people over the internet. And she produced her completely digital rock opera, Libertaria, the virtual opera, using only the tools that she had collaborating with people online. So I would like to introduce Sabrina Pena Young and her talk, Singing Geneticists in an Epic Machinima Cyberspace Opera. Okay. Thanks. Hi, my name is Sabrina Pena Young, and I'm an intermediate composer and a big sci-fi lover, in case you can't tell. When I was a kid, like any little girl, I wanted to be a famous rock drummer when I grew up. But when I went to college, I traded in my drumsticks for a computer. 
and decided to study music technology, study film, study video. I really enjoy taking classical music and mashing it with music technology and creating new kinds of work that have never been done before. So, a few years ago, I decided I wanted to make an epic opera. A really epic opera, a sci-fi opera with explosions and pyrotechnics and all the craziness that a modern day opera would have. This was gonna be epic. However, there was a problem. I didn't have an opera company. I didn't have any music, didn't have any money, didn't have any musicians. All I had were the ever in motion ideas in my brain, that's my brain, and my computer. So I decided to go online and create an epic opera for the digital generations of today using internet collaboration. So the great thing about technology is that all you need is technology and talent and passion, and you can create great things. And that's how I created Libertaria, the virtual opera. There. This is not the opera. <laughs> Here we go. There's also sound. <laughs> uh, gotta love technology when it works. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Applause. This is. Thank you. Wait till you hear the music. It's even better with the opera part. So after a thousand takes and three years of music production and zero rehearsals later, we created Libertaria the Virtual Opera, an epic animated opera that could be enjoyed by anyone online for free, created entirely through internet collaboration. Now, the cool thing about Libertaria the Virtual Opera is that anybody can enjoy it. You don't have to get fancy tickets, you don't have to do anything to go ahead and enjoy this. You don't even have to go to a concert hall, it's for everyone. Libertaria the Virtual Opera tells the story of a teen girl named Libertaria who escapes from a genetics factory, teams up with her addict father, Want, to me. and then decides to beat up on a bunch of geneticists with a cyborg army. Now, there were a lot of challenges with Libertaria the Virtual Opera. All was not peaches and Ewoks. Okay, so what we ended up doing was, you know, with a digital production, there's a lot of, there's a lot of challenges. Um, so one of the things we needed first, of course, were singers. I didn't have any singers. So what I decided to do was I went online and I set up virtual auditions. Now, a virtual audition was pretty easy. I set out a post, said, hey, who wants to sing in my opera film? And then interested singers went and sent in their recordings of their voices. Those that were selected, and we had people auditioning from North America, South America, and even Europe, those that were interested in auditioning and then were selected would then record themselves on location and send those those recordings to me via the cloud. And then we mix all these crazy audio files into a massive soundtrack. Now the other thing we needed were animators because imagination and animation go great together, especially when you're thinking epic. So what I did was I decided to go ahead and go online and I found some animation forums. And these animation forums had all these people that were just dying to get involved in a project like this. The third thing was all these recordings. We ended up with over 1,000 vocal recordings, each of which I personally edited and mixed down. And then when the deadline loomed and it looked like we weren't gonna make it, we decided to do a crowdfunding campaign online once again, and we were able to hire an additional composer to help finish mastering the track. In the end, we had an awesome animated opera that anybody can enjoy for free. This is an opera that changes the way that we think about opera, where we dress up and we buy expensive tickets and sit down very quietly and make sure we don't clap between movements. That's bad, okay? With Libertaria the Virtual Opera, you could sit down at home and watch it in your pajamas. Libertaria is the opera that you could watch with your bunny slippers on. <laughs> so, <laughs> now I also wanted to open source the opera. So what I did was I wrote a, a little blog post to all those evil pirates out there and said, please steal my film. And ARG, they did. It's all over the place. Everybody loves it. I don't know who they are, but they like it. They steal it. 
Now, one of the reasons that we were able to do this is because our animation style that we chose was called machinima. Now, for those familiar with animation, you might have heard of machinima before. Machinima is a lot different than traditional animation, where you draw each frame, frame by frame by frame. And it takes woof, tens of thousands, millions of frames sometimes to make something. Or even computer animation that we often see with films today, where you essentially need an entire warehouse full of CPUs in order to go ahead and process these really complicated graphics. If you can't notice, I'm not really a major motion picture kind of person. It's me and two other people. So we decided to go with machinima. The great thing about machinima is that in machinima, you kind of have this video game environment. You design a scene, you drop your characters in there, and you just tell them what to do. You say, hey, run, jump, sing while dying dastardly. Um, and so that's what you do with machinima. It's really, really easy to use. It's really inexpensive. In fact, it's so easy that even my four-year-old daughter was able to sit next to me and help me design which, you know, buildings to blow up and stuff. Four-year-olds like that kind of stuff. Anyway, and the other great thing about it, it's really, really, really inexpensive. In fact, we were able to do a feature-length animated opera for, with only three people for less than $1,000, which, I mean, that's really, really amazing. The great thing about machinima is you have an unlimited number of costumes, you have unlimited number of characters. So if your opera or your production or your film needs like 200 people, all you have to do is uh, just keep clicking and they all show up. It's kind of neat. Another thing you can do is you can have an unlimited number of scenes. It could be in outer space, or like for us, we had Evil Genetics Factory. One of my animators created this really complicated underground world. Um, and it's really easy to blow things up. Not that I like to blow things up, but it was really easy to do it. Oh, also, you have an unlimited number of evil reverse aging singing geneticists. That's super exciting. Opera is meant to be epic. It's always been an epic way to tell the tale of our time, way before film. In fact, it was a way for the underlings to make fun of our evil overlords in a great, fun way, maybe with a tad little bit too much vibrato. Oops. Opera is meant for everyone. I wanted to make an opera that you could enjoy, whether you live in Africa or live in the United States, whether you can afford concert tickets or can't afford concert tickets, whether you have a smartphone or you have a laptop. I wanted everybody to be able to enjoy opera because opera is such a great form of art. And with Libertaria, you can enjoy it with a smartphone on the big screen, the little screen, you can listen to it on earbuds. And what's the great thing about Libertaria is that the audience can interact with it in the way that they want to. Have a favorite song, you can listen to it over and over and over and over and over again. You have a song that you really like, you can share it through social media. You don't like it, just let me know through the comments. I know. Okay? So, and you can even steal it and mash it yourself and re-upload it somewhere else and just make something new. I mean, that's the great thing about digital technology, right? You can just take something and you can remix it and make it your own. And finally, collaboration is very cool, obviously, by these guys. Okay, internet collaboration is the key, I think, today to classical music succeeding. With opera company after opera company folding and big classical music organizations struggling so much, generations of kids don't even have a chance to explore classical music or the arts in school anymore. But the great thing about collaboration is that there are literally millions of artists out there that want to create something great with someone else. And you don't have to live in the same continent. You don't have to live in the same country. You don't have to have a lot of money or a lot of power. All you need is that technology and passion and that talent. Libertaria the Virtual Opera is about the future of our world and our society. But it's also about the future of opera, the future of the arts. It's a new and exciting way to take a handful of people with dedication and passion and to create a brand new grand work of art, an opera. And you know, it could be an opera, it could be a film, it could be a video game, it could be anything that your mind can come up with, anything that you can imagine. But it's gonna take engineers, it's gonna take video game developers, and artists and designers, musicians, all kinds of people, all these creative people for the next big idea in art. And who knows, maybe the next Wagner, or the next Mozart, or the next Shields? It could be one of you. So, these are some of the people that went ahead and helped make the opera. And I don't know, there was supposed to be one more clip. Want to me? There we go. What do you think? I'm just having a drink. A sweet a taste of life again. Down the throat and Down the throat and into the zone. Down, down.
Thank you. Do I give this to them back there? Thank you very much, Sabrina. So as I mentioned before, TEDx is all about mixing live speakers with video of speakers of the past. And I'd like to introduce one of those videos now. Uh, this is a video by Phil Hansen titled, Embrace the Shake. So when I was in art school, I developed a shake in my hand, and this was the straightest line I could draw. Now, in hindsight, it was actually good for some things, like mixing a can of paint or shaking a Polaroid. But at the time, this was really doomsday. This was, this was the destruction of my dream of becoming an artist. The shake developed out of really a single-minded pursuit of pointillism, just years of making tiny, tiny dots. And eventually, these dots went from being perfectly round to looking more like tadpoles because of the shake. So to compensate, I'd hold the pen tighter, and this progressively made the shake worse, so I'd hold the pen tighter still. And this became a vicious cycle that ended up causing so much pain and joint issues, I had trouble holding anything. And after spending all my life wanting to do art, I left art school, and then I left art completely. But after a few years, I just couldn't stay away from art, and I decided to go to a neurologist about the shake and discovered I had permanent nerve damage. And <laughs> he actually took one look at my squiggly line and said, well, why don't you just embrace the shake? So I did. I went home, I grabbed a pencil, and I just started letting my hand shake and shake. I was making all these scribble pictures. And even though it wasn't the kind of art that I was ultimately passionate about, it felt great. And more importantly, once I embraced the shake, I realized I could still make art. I just had to find a different approach to making the art that I wanted. Now, I still enjoyed the fragmentation of pointillism, seeing these little tiny dots come together to make this unified whole. So I began experimenting with other ways to fragment images where the shake wouldn't affect the work, like dipping my feet in paint and walking on a canvas. Or in a 3D structure consisting of two by fours, creating a 2D image by burning it with a blowtorch. I discovered that if I worked in a larger scale and with bigger materials, my hand really wouldn't hurt. And after having gone from a single approach to art, I ended up having an approach to creativity that completely changed my artistic horizons. This was the first time I'd encountered this idea that embracing a limitation could actually drive creativity. At the time, I was finishing up school, and I was so excited to get a real job and finally afford new art supplies. I had this horrible little set of tools, and I felt like I could do so much more with the supplies I thought an artist was supposed to have. I actually didn't even have a regular pair of scissors. I was using these metal shears until I stole a pair from the office that I worked at. So I got out of school, I got a job, I got a paycheck, I got myself to the art store, and I just went nuts buying supplies. And then when I got home, I sat down and I set myself to test to really try to create something just completely outside of the box but I sat there for hours, and nothing came to mind. The same thing the next day, and then the next, quickly slipping into a creative slump. And I was in a dark place for a long time, unable to create. And it didn't make any sense, because I was finally able to support my art, and yet I was creatively blank. But as I searched around in the darkness, I realized I was actually paralyzed by all of the choices that I never had before. And it was then that I thought back to my jittery hands, embraced the shake. And I realized if I ever wanted my creativity back, I, I had to quit trying so hard to think outside of the box and get back into it. I wondered, could you become more creative then by looking for limitations? What if I could only create with a dollar's worth of supplies? At this point, I was spending a lot of my evenings in well, I guess I still spend a lot of my evenings in Starbucks, but I know you can ask for an extra cup if you want one. So I decided to ask for 50. Surprisingly, they just handed them right over, and then with some pencils I already had, I made this project for only 80 cents. It really became a moment of clarification for me that we need to first be limited in order to become limitless. 
I took this approach of thinking inside the box to my canvas and wondered what if instead of painting on a canvas, I could only paint on my chest. So I painted 30 images, one layer at a time, one on top of another, with each picture representing an influence in my life. Or what if instead of painting with a brush, I could only paint with karate chops? <laughs> so I dipped my hands in paint, and I just, I just attacked the canvas, and I actually hit so hard that I bruised a joint in my pinky, and it was stuck straight for a couple weeks. <laughs> or what if, what if instead of relying on myself, I had to rely on other people to create the content for the art. So for six days, I lived in front of a webcam, I slept on the floor, and I ate takeout. And I asked people to call me and share a story with me about a life-changing moment. Their stories became the art as I wrote them onto the revolving canvas. <laughs> Or what if instead of making art to display, I had to destroy it. This seemed like the ultimate limitation, being an artist without art. This destruction idea turned into a year-long project that I called Goodbye Art, where each and every piece of art had to be destroyed after its creation. In the beginning of Goodbye Art, I focused on forced destruction, like this image of Jimi Hendrix, made with over 7,000 matches. <laughs> Then I opened it up to creating art that was destroyed naturally. I looked for temporary materials, like spitting out food. <laughs> Sidewalk chalk. And even frozen wine. The, the last iteration of destruction was to try to produce something that didn't actually exist in the first place. So I organized candles on a table, I lit them and then blew them out, then repeated this process over and over with the same set of candles, then assembled the videos into the larger image. So the end image was never visible as a physical whole. It was destroyed before it ever existed. In the course of this Goodbye Art series, I created 23 different pieces with nothing left to physically display. What I thought would be the ultimate limitation actually turned out to be the ultimate liberation, as each time I created, the destruction brought me back to a neutral place where I felt refreshed and ready to start the next project. It, didn't, it did not happen overnight. <laughs> There were times when my projects failed to get off the ground, or even worse, after spending tons of time on them, the end image was kind of embarrassing. But having committed to the process, I continued on, and something really surprising came out of this. As I destroyed each project, I was learning to let go. Let go of outcomes, let go of failures, and let go of imperfections. And in return, I found a process of creating art that's perpetual and unencumbered by results. I found myself in a state of constant creation, thinking only of what's next and coming up with more ideas than ever. When I think back to my three years away from art, away from my dream, just going through the motions, instead of trying to find a different way to continue that dream, I just quit. I gave up. And what if I didn't embrace the shake? Because embracing the shake for me wasn't just about art and having art skills. It turned out to be about life and having life skills. Because ultimately, most of what we do takes place here, inside the box with limited resources. Learning to be creative within the confines of our limitations is the best hope we have to transform ourselves and collectively transform our world. Looking at limitations as a source of creativity changed the course of my life. Now, when I run into a barrier or I find myself creatively stumped, I sometimes still struggle, but I continue to show up for the process and try to remind myself of the possibilities, like using hundreds of real live worms to make an image, <laughs> using a pushpin to tattoo a banana, or painting a picture with hamburger grease. <laughs> One of my most recent endeavors is to try to translate the habits of creativity that I've learned into something others can replicate. Limitations may be the most unlikely of places to harness creativity, but perhaps one of the best ways to get ourselves out of ruts, 
rethink categories and challenge accepted norms. And instead of telling each other to seize the day, maybe we can remind ourselves every day to seize the limitation. Thank you. So folks, at this point, it's about 10.20. We're going to take about a 20-minute break. Get up, stretch your legs, have some coffee provided by Coffee Culture, uh, use the restrooms, and we'll see you back here at about 10.40.
since that was such a success, let's, uh, let's do burpees now. Ready? Thanks, guys. So, we've all heard that playing a sport is important because it emphasizes teamwork, fair play, and even builds character. But one thing Annalisa Calvert has noticed is that learning a sport early can have a major impact on staying healthy. So, I would like to now present our next speaker, Annalisa Calvert, or to some, Coach Tex. Okay, I'd like for everyone to take a second and imagine something happens. Your phone rings right now and you get a terrible phone call. Your house is burned down. Who's the first person you choose to call? Is it maybe your spouse, a mom, probably your insurance agent? How about your child's soccer coach? No, that's not who I'd call either. But for a little boy who I coached a couple of years ago, his house burned down. And the first person his mom called was me because he had lost his uniform and that uniform meant so much to him. Sports have an impact on our kids, a very real and tangible impact. They create a sense of belonging, of community, and of accomplishment for our kids. I don't think many adults would disagree that sports can provide a ton of great life lessons. They can teach kids great sportsmanship, how to lose with dignity, how to pick themselves up after a loss and how to win. Can teach them how to work in a group. But sometimes we forget and think that sports are about getting that next college scholarship or finding a multi-million dollar contract. The fact of the matter is that most kids aren't going to get a college scholarship. In fact, only 8% of high school athletes will go on to get a college scholarship. And of that tiny 8%, only 2% more will go on to become a professional athlete. And that's okay, because the point of youth sports isn't really about a multi-million dollar contract in the end. I would like to ask everybody to re think about how we can reimagine sports so that youth development is really the purpose. Our kids have so much potential, and sports is a great way to guide that. Sports can play this great role, can teach kids to love a game, but more importantly, it can give them health and wellness benefits, and it can provide them with a really strong mentor who can mean something to kids throughout their life. So I wanna talk a little bit about those two things today, and I have to confess I was a history major, so you're gonna have to deal with a little history with me real quick. Um, so beginning in the or late 1960s, we started to see a decline in deaths from diabetes-related diseases for our kids. But then in about 1985, those numbers started to increase again. Sadly, Nike recently did a, a study, and today's 10-year-olds are the first generation who are expected to have a shorter life expectancy than their parents. That's a big deal. On top of that, we have a huge gap happening in our country. There are about 18 million kids in our country who are looking for a positive adult mentor in their life, but only 3 million are really able to find those. So there are 15 million kids in our country who need an adult who cares about them and can't find one right now. Finally, the Children's Defense Fund reports that one in three African-American boys born today and one in six Hispanic or Latino boys born are likely to end up in, in prison. Imagine if it's your son. Would you like their risk of imprisonment to be that high? I know I don't want that for my son. And also, oops. We are cutting physical education across the board for academic success. Our kids need to play and they need to be active. In fact, the more active they are, um, the President's Council on Fitness reports, the, they're more likely to be successful academically, to have increased attendance, and to have less behavioral issues. But we've made our, our world pay to play. Half of the kids, the Buffalo News just reported, half of the kids in the city of Buffalo live in poverty and yet we expect them to get the benefits of sport or extracurricular activities, even though they have to pay for them. 
So the question becomes, what do we do? Our kids are becoming more unhealthy, um, physical fitness is constantly being cut, and they don't have positive role models. Do we sit back and let that happen? I say no. I wanna tell you a quick story about one of uh, my favorite kids I ever coached. Um, a couple of years ago, I was coaching a travel team, which is a little bit above that house recreational level and below the kind of elite level of, of soccer. And this young lady came to us. She was a little bit heavier set, kind of quiet and shy. Her sister played with us as well. Um, and her sister kind of outsh outshined her. She was younger, but she was kind of the star in a way. And this young lady decided to play the goal. And she started to have a lot of success on the field. She made some great saves. And all of a sudden, you see her kind of her confidence building. The kids are looking to her. They're sharing stories. They're laughing. She comes back and plays the next year. At the end of that season, she started high school at a Buffalo public school. And she tried out for the soccer team. And she made the varsity soccer team. And then she had the confidence to try for the basketball team. And then she tried out for the tennis team. And she starts to get great grades. And she's a senior this year. And next year, she's looking to attend either SUNY Binghamton or UB. Her story was changed from the confidence she got when she started to play sports. So our program, um, Buffalo Soccer Club, started in 2007. And in the fall of 2011, we were really excited. We felt like we were ready to take that next step. So we applied for the U.S. Soccer Foundation Soccer for Success, Soccer for Success Grant. Um, and the U.S. Soccer Foundation had been developing this program over a couple of years um, with a couple of core components in, involved. Um, the program would run three times a week for 90 minutes. 60 minutes of that program would be really focused on moderate to vigorous activity. And it would run for 12 consecutive weeks twice a year. So the kids would get 24 weeks of soccer. The really cool thing about the program, I felt, was that the curriculum integrated health and wellness right into the everyday session. So the kids are playing soccer, but they're also learning health and wellness. Our coaches don't lecture on health and wellness. They integrate it into the program. So the example I use is when I was a kid, I played sharks and minnows. The sharks were in the minnow middle. The minnows tried to dribble their soccer balls across and not get tagged by a shark. What we do with our kids is we play snackers. So healthy snacks are in the middle, and the kids pick all sorts of healthy snacks. I'm always impressed like when we get kiwi or mango and the junk food is on the other end, and I can tell you they know every chip and candy in the book. And those kids try to race across and not get tagged by the healthy snacks. When they get tagged by a healthy snack, they have to come up with their own healthy snack. So we've integrated these pieces really nicely into the program. The kids don't really realize, they don't feel like they're being lectured to, they're just learning nutrition information. So we applied for this grant um, with the United Way of Buffalo and Erie County and the Independent Health Foundation, and in January or February of 2012, we were, found out we were awarded that grant. And for me, personally, it was one of the proudest moments of my professional career. It was something that our collaboration took really, really seriously, is making sure this program had the value for Buffalo um, that it could. There were only 12 cities across the nation that were picked, and we were, we were really lucky to be one of them. Um, so in 2012, the fall, we started our program with some Buffalo Public Schools, some charter schools, and the Boys and Girls Clubs of Buffalo. And we learned how to run this program in a small gym with kids who don't have access to, to physical activity very often. Um, and we wanted to prove that the program was, was really making an impact. So we tested uh, BMI, body mass index, waist circumference, and cardiovascular endurance. And we measured the kids in the beginning. So we pre-tested them, and then we post-tested them. Um, and we've run this program for two and a half years now, um, working with about 1,200 kids. We've grown from 10 locations to 20. Um, and we've seen some really great, really great results. Um, and some of these are national and some of them are local, I'll share both. Um, so 79% of the kids who were at a high um, risk for health issues maintained or improved their BMI. 75% um, of them did that locally just here in Buffalo. 80% um, maintained or improved their cardiovascular endurance. Locally here in Buffalo, we have a 85% rate for that. And nationally, 75% um, maintained or improved their waist circumference. And the really cool thing about this was kids who are at high risk of, of health issues tend to continuously increase. So even maintaining showed success within the program. And that was something I didn't actually know in the beginning. I kind of learned through the program. Um, but the statistic that really stuck out to me, we did a nutrition survey pre and post as well. And at the end of participating in the Soccer for Success program, 84% of kids said they enjoyed exercising more after playing. 
So if you think about it, 84% of our kids didn't really like exercise and now they do. And the long-term health implications there for our kids and our community are astronomical. On top of the health and wellness benefits, um, we really focus on mentoring. There are 15 million kids without a mentor and one-on-one -on -one mentors are gonna be the best opportunity for a kid. But with 15 million kids looking for mentors, we need some other ideas. So our coaching staff, um, we train them on how to be positive mentors. There is one coach for every 12 kids. They arrive 15 minutes early to set up and they stay 15 minutes after to, to take a session down. But during that time, the kids are able to come and talk to them if they need to. And you'd be surprised how many kids like picking up cones and putting down cones in order to have two or three extra minutes with their coach that day. Um, we work at about 20 sites with, like I said, around 700 kids. So we're hiring 50 to 60 coaches a year. So we spend a lot of time really focused and training the coaches on how to be mentors. We teach them, we're not gonna scream at our kids to get their attention. We teach them how to get attention in a positive way. Um, we teach them how to manage behavior rather than just react to it, which is sometimes difficult in a tight gym space. And we teach them how to develop strong, meaningful, and appropriate relationships with the kids. Um, I had a mom come to me, we have a family day at the end of every year, and I had a mom come to me recently and tell me that her daughter, who was nine in third grade, had very few friends. She had some social issues and some developmental issues. And after playing in the soccer program, she was talking to the other girls in her grade and she had some friends. And this mom felt like the coach had really impacted her and given her the confidence to take that step and go outside of her boundaries. Stories like that and moments like that happen all the time in our program because our coaches are making the environments fun and safe for every kid, no matter their ability level and no matter where they're coming from. What's great about this program is that it doesn't have to be just soccer. Um, our, our program actually hopes to move into other sports eventually. It doesn't have to be just Buffalo, and it doesn't even just have to be the U.S. Sports have an impact, and if our communities and our programs are focused on what we want to achieve, um, what is really important for the community and the players and their families and put that first, and if we look and train our coaches to look at the long-term impact we can have on our community, we can make sports great again. I believe that the greatest gift we can give our children is the opportunity to live long, healthy lives and to have positive people in their life on a consistent basis. People ask me all the time, what do you get out of your program? What do your kids get out of your program? And I always laugh because I can think of a hundred stories and thousands of kids, and I know that nine times out of 10, I don't get to see the end result. But I know that this program is making a huge impact on kids. Together, by making sports youth development focused and not just about wins and losses, we can make sports great again for our kids. Thank you. Thanks, Annalisa. So, <laughs> have you guys seen these cat pictures on the internet? <laughs> I subscribe to like half a dozen different blogs. <laughs> they do the silliest things. <laughs> uh. Psychologist Kimberly Young is a professor at St. Bonaventure University and founder and director of the Center for Internet Addiction in, uh, in Bradford, PA. She also founded the first inpatient clinic for internet addiction recovery in the United States at the Bradford Regional Medical Center. Young argues that we're each a bit too connected to our devices and specializes in identifying the warning signs to addictive behavior, particularly at a very young age. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Kimberly Young and her talk, Internet Addiction, What Everyone Should Know. Hello. Well, I started studying internet addiction in 1995, shortly after a friend of mine's husband was addicted to AOL chat rooms. He was spending 40, 50, 60 hours a week at a time when it was still $2.95 an hour. Create a financial burden, but their marriage ended in divorce when he started meeting women in online chat rooms. Now, 
it made me wonder if people could get addicted to the internet in the same way we talk about drugs, alcohol, and sex. So I posted a small survey online. I took the same clinical criteria that one would use to define uh, pathological gambling, and I just substituted the word internet, and I just wanted to see what I would find. Well, back when I probably had two email a month, I had over 50 emails, all from people telling me how they lost their jobs and their marriages, students across the country having problems with the very tool that they were being encouraged to use. So I expanded my survey, and by 1996, I had presented the first study on internet addiction at the American Psychological Association. And by 1998, I wrote Caught in the Net, the first book to identify internet addiction as a new disorder. Now, all this was met with great controversy and skepticism, which I understood. Look, it was new. It was before the dot-com bubble burst. But I'm here to say, 20 years later, this is now considered a rapidly new field. There's been thousands of internet uh, research uh, topics on internet addiction. It's now not only just looking at it, but looking at treatment protocols, looking at risk factors. There's hundreds of inpatient treatment centers looking at this as a real disorder. So here I am today to talk a little bit about what is internet addiction? What are some of the ways people get hooked and how can we better manage technology in our day-to-day -day lives? Now one of the first questions I'm often asked is how much time is too much? And that'd be like trying to diagnose alcoholism by counting the number of drinks one consumes. You know, 10 drinks a week is okay, but 11 or more is a problem. We really can't quantify addictions that way. What we're really doing is trying, especially with the ubiquitous nature of the internet, what we really want to do is look at a set of behaviors. So let's see. You know, the first one, here you have somebody texting while driving, but that's really only part of the pathology. What we often see are people preoccupied with their cell phones and their digital devices. Ask yourself, how many times do you check your smartphone during the day? I know people that check their Facebook 50 times a day. I know that they check their Twitter feed 50 times a day, their email 50 times a day. I've worked with people that have gotten into three, four, five car accidents, texting while driving. And thank God they didn't kill themselves or others, but they can't seem to stop the compulsive behavior. Here is an internet cafe from China. In China, Korea, and Taiwan, internet addiction is most problematic and most prevalent. Here you're looking at people that might spend 8, 10, 12 hours every day gaming. Now when you talk about symptoms, here you're talking about you know, how long they spend on the internet, consequences because of behavior, losing sleep, losing poor nutrition, um, losing interest in other activities just to be on the game. Now, in America, it's considered more of a silent addiction. You know, you're not seeing a lot of these internet cafes here. It's happening in your homes, in people's bedrooms. And there are gamers that we treat that, you know, they can't, they fail school because they can't stop gaming. Or they live back at home uh, at their parents because they can't hold a job because they can't stop gaming. We also treat what I call Facebook moms here we are, Facebook moms, and um, yeah, you know, do you know anybody that plays Candy Crush Saga, um, Farmville, or a number of games? But now I'm talking about people that also, you know, forget to pick up their kids at school, forget to feed them dinner, or they forget to, you know, put them to bed. They're so consumed by the behavior. We also treat men addicted to internet pornography, and if they're doing this in their job, there we go. If they're doing this at work, then they risk getting fired. If they do this at home, they risk getting divorced. With, we also treat, uh, just, I'm sorry, I'm clicking and there we go. Um, we also treat people who are addicted to internet gambling and they're spending money they don't have on virtual casinos. And oftentimes, this isn't the same person who might go to Atlantic City or Vegas, but it's usually a younger, tech-savvy, male-dominated set of teenagers and college students. With any element of addiction is an element of escape. What you're really looking at are people that can create these online lives through the computer that they like better than their own. So here with a lot of gamers, these are virtual worlds or communities. So these gamers can create an avatar or a character and live in a virtual world with other gamers, okay? And there's usually battles and goals within the game to uh, achieve. But now you might have somebody who's in real life, has low self-esteem, is 
you know, socially very awkward, but yet in the game, they become a great warrior. And now they've earned respect. They've earned power and dominance and recognition from the other gamers. And this is very important to understand because that's really part of the psychology of what we're saying is more the addiction. Here's a screenshot from Second Life. This is more of a virtual community. And within Second Life, what happens is that you have, um, you know, residents, as they call them. And it's more just a virtual community where you can hang out, you can go shopping, you can go have a job, you can go to take college classes. So you live, you hang out. And it's like a game, but it, it gives the example that I'm trying to make about these virtual worlds. So first off, you create an avatar where I can be anybody I want to be, okay? I could be a tall blonde. I could be a short redhead. I could be older, thinner, taller, younger. I could be a man. And that's the wish fulfillment. I can create in my virtual second life something I can't do in my real life. And that's very important. Now, in order to actually buy things in Second Life, it's free to set up your avatar, but then American currency gets exchanged into Linden dollars. Linden Labs owns Second Life. So there's currency to buy clothes, to buy a car, to buy a home, to buy furnishings in this virtual community. So that's very important. Actually, economists study this. I mean, millions of people use this, and they look at consumer behavior. Now, Clinically, I see it on the downside of it, where people spend and invest an awful lot in their virtual world. So for example, I worked with a 55-year-old uh, legal secretary. And in her real life, she had a very modest home, modest cars, modest clothes. She had embezzled $400,000 from the law firm she worked for, all to support her second life avatar. Again, in her real life, very modest living. In her second life, she was a great baroness. She had diamonds and you know, jewelry and furs, and she had uh, exotic cars and exotic homes, and she had this sort of wish fulfillment of status and power that she could not achieve in her own life. So what do we do about all this? Does treatment and recovery mean going cold turkey? And the answer is no. This isn't like treating, uh, using an absence model like you would for drugs or alcohol. It's really more about a food addiction. And it's looking at moderated, controlled, positive use of this technology. So the kind of terms that we often use then with clients are digital diet and digital nutrition. So with digital diet, you're talking about a restriction in the number of hours, very much like you would the restriction in the number of calories one consumes. So instead of checking Facebook 50 times a day, you check it once a day. Instead of checking Twitter 50 times a day, maybe three times a day. Instead of email 50 times a day, maybe only three times. So it's very prescribed, very controlled use of the internet. Now, with digital nutrition, it's actually about what you click on. So if you're the gamer who can't you know, go to school and, and is failing out and living back at home with his parents because you can't hold a job, maybe you need to abstain from gaming. But you can still use the internet for very practical things. Maybe you need to research a paper for school, or you need your email for work, or you need to make airline reservations or hotel reservations. So there's really about productive use of the internet, and it's sort of the difference between you know, eating your uh, bag of potato chips or maybe eating fruits and vegetables. Okay? So it's really, again, not villainizing technology, but really trying to say, how is this promoted in our own daily lives? Now here's a photograph of a family sitting around the dinner table and they're all on their technology. This might even be your own home, right? I argue that we're all a bit too connected. And, and you know, we live in a lot of electronic noise that we don't even think about. You know, how many times do you go out to dinner and you see the couple next door to you and they're just looking at their, their screens? And they're not talking to each other. How many times do you go to the mall and you see a group of teenagers and they're just texting and, talk, and not talking? All right, we do, we live with kind of all this noise in our day-to-day -day lives. So what can you do to better manage technology every day? Well, first, I got three tips. First, check your checking. You know, how many times do you check your smartphone each day? The next time you feel the need to check it, stop. You, you know, be more present with the person around you. You know, is it really that important to keep checking that cell phone all the time? I mean, look, I'm a victim of this too. Every week I go to meetings and the first thing everybody at the meeting puts their smartphones on the table and, and a few minutes into the meeting, what does somebody do? You know, somebody's checking their, their email, somebody's texting. You're not really being present. And as much as we like to think we can multitask, we can't. You know, we don't do that very well and research says so. The, this kind of leads to the second point, set time limits. Set some boundaries in your day-to-day -day life. If you're a parent, 
How many times are you checking your smartphone in front of your children and what kind of behavior is that modeling? You know, if you're a couple, leave, leave the cell phones at home and go out to dinner. Actually talk. People are like, wow, really? I challenge everyone to take a 48-hour digital detox in your own life. Maybe it's Friday night, you plug the phone on the charger, and you don't look at it again till Monday morning. Or take any two days, and people go, well, no, I need to check my phone. I can, what are you saying? That's ludicrous. But you know what? I guarantee you, you will feel better. You know what? You're going to have renewed energy and renewed time because you don't really realize how much you start to check it. We've learned to live without boredom or idle time in our environment because we just kind of fill it now with technology. And so anytime you're bored, you, you look down and, oh, did somebody text me? Probably it's not that important. But I guarantee you, you'll feel a lot differently about it. And this leads to the next and final point, disconnect to reconnect. Have tech-free family time every night. Maybe the dinner table, there's no devices. Maybe even one hour after dinner, you say no media, no television, no video games, no nothing. And people go, well, what do we do? Well, I don't know, maybe you'll talk to each other. You know, think about that. You know, when I was younger, we used to take Sunday drives all the time, and it was our kind of family time. Think about the Sunday drive today where, you know, somebody's wearing the iPod, somebody's playing a DVD player, somebody's texting, somebody's gaming on their phone. No, leave it at home really kind of focus in on each other. I guarantee you, you're going to feel much better and have more quality relationships. It's, it's not a permanent thing. It's just temporary pieces in your day-to-day -day life that'll really improve your relationships. Now, one of the more alarming things now is that children as young as two, three, and four years old now have access to technology. Actually, there's a picture there of the iPad uh, bouncy seat, okay? And over here is an iPotty chair. So. Yeah, no kidding, huh? So what happens now is you have um, toddlers that now we've put technology right into their, their devices like their electronic toys. And some people would say, well, that's harmless. Isn't that, oh, no big deal, no. The question is now shifted from how much time is too much to how young is too young because new research is already starting to show great concerns. New social science research is concerned that kids are more isolated in front of computers. So what happens is they're just sitting there isolated in front of screens and they're not getting out playing with other kids. They're not learning how to collaborate and work together in teams. We're also starting to see with neuroscience research reading deficits with young children because the more time they're spending scrolling on the internet, think about this, it's scanning, it's skimming, it's scrolling, it's not reading, all right? I mean, they might be reading information, but it's not the same skill set as if you have a child reading a book. It requires much more attention and concentration skills that they're not getting the more screen time they have, the less time they're able or less able to read books because what's happening is it's much more of a line by line, page by page linear process. There's even new research concerned about childhood obesity and kids are just sedentary now. They're not getting out, moving around and playing because they're sedentary in front of screens. So what do we do about some of these big picture issues? And there is a lot of you know, concern, I think, of late. There we go. And one of the things that um, I was very honored, this picture is me at, <coughs> excuse me, this picture is of myself, and I was the keynote speaker at the first International Congress on Internet Addiction Disorders held in Milan, Italy last year. And this was really a big honor but not only just to see myself in this role and where it's come, but when I started off, I said this has been a rapidly evolving field. I mean, there were delegates from a multitude of countries all talking about national and government initiatives that they were doing to deal with the prevention and treatment of Internet addiction while America was seen as lagging behind. We have no government intervention. And this was really a get big concern. I mean, just by comparison, Korea alone had over 500 inpatient units or hospitals treating internet addiction. Korea also had prevention programs in every single school system in their country. Again, we didn't really do that much. And I remember thinking a great deal about this when I you know, was flying back saying, what can we be doing? What are some of the things we can be doing right in our own community and schools? So I came up with this idea of being screen smart. And one of the issues really was that, you know, technology is a gift. And how we use it, we can use it rather wisely. 
So being screen smart is really kind of taking on the food role and saying, let's make smarter, wiser choices. So for example, could you be you know, doing screenings in our schools to identify those kids that are most at risk? Could we be offering prevention classes to young children so they learn at an early age how to use the technology more responsibly? Could we be training teachers to look at you know, assessing kids, look for warning signs and risk factors, and even intervening with them since they're on the front lines? Could we be talking directly to parents about some of these concerns? For example, I came up with the 3, 6, 9, 12 parenting guidelines. So at each developmental age, at age 3, at age 6, 9, and 12, parents really need different technology you know, rules, and I think kids have different technology needs. So I think collectively, if we start looking about this as being screen smart, I think overall, in looking at how we manage our technology in our day-to-day -day lives, we'll all have a more balanced way of using technology without being consumed by it. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. Young. Dr. Young makes a lot of really good points with so, many, so much technology today, it's hard for some of us to disconnect. I mean, think about it. Many of us have these complex computers right in our pockets that we use all the time. And with so much technology at our fingertips, I'm surprised the computers haven't thought of a way to just do all of our thinking for us. How do we know they don't? Dr. Kenneth Reagan is a professor in computer science and engineering at UB and is an international chess master who has worked in computational complexity theory since 1981. He also conducts a second major research program on human decision making. So what does this mean? Dr. Reagan has the ability to distinguish computer behavior from human in the, in the game of chess. That also means he'll be the first person I call if I suspect my family has been replaced with robots. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Kenneth Reagan and getting to know our digital assistants. Thank you very much. Getting to know you, getting to learn all about you, getting to like you, getting to hope you like me. In the musical, the guy, Anna, is plunged into an exotic environment to run a school for children of the court of the King of Siam. In motion today, an exotic court of computer personas is being plunged amid us. The voice in your GPS, Apple Siri, and IBM Watson may be the best known, but here come Google Now, Sylvia, which is a whole AI building platform, and Microsoft Cortana. Online gaming personas are legion in Second Life and many other games. Cortana came from the game Halo, where she is an AI gone bad. These personal digital assistants, PDAs, are here to help us. But sometimes we feel and fear that we are the ones being schooled. And rightly so, we need to get to know them. They are not precisely our cup of tea. If they were, would they be as useful? Let's start by asking, what do they do? Now, they could ultimately work like in the movie Her, that is, organize our lives, stoke our creativity, stroke our ego, form a relationship. But practically and immediately, they work as cognitive agents. That is, they read lots of information, evaluate options, write recommendations so as to guide our decision-making. Yes, decision-making is the key. Which roads to take, where to eat, where to stay, what kind of hotel, what's the best deal? Indeed, for some of you, 
your most prototypical interaction with a digital agent has not been with the suave or sultry siren, but rather an 80-year-old guy, the Priceline negotiator. <laughs> William Shatner, who played Captain Kirk on Star Trek. Hold that meme, we'll come back to him and Spock. We may empower deal-making agents to negotiate on our behalf, act autonomously, drive a harder bargain, even walk away from deals when we might be afraid to. If you own stocks or mutual funds, they are subject to automated trading. We need to learn how agents make decisions when left on our own and how to avoid becoming slaves to them. We've all seen flash crashes on the stock market and people following their GPS into flash floods. How can we make a partnership with these agents? What about their cognitive style is different from ours? That's where my work chimes in. For eight years, I've been involved with a certain kind of decision agent, computer chess programs, being consulted when they're not supposed to be. In human chess games, that's cheating. The issue is that computers have gone from chump to champ over the years since I began playing tournaments in 1970. In the 1980s, they reached master rank, and one of them held me to a draw. In 1997, world champion Garry Kasparov famously lost to an IBM supercomputer. Well, in 2006, his successor, Vladimir Kramnik, lost to an ordinary home PC. Well, super has gotten smaller, and the programs keep getting better. In a matchup of Gary versus Siri today, I bet on Siri. And evidently, a few players in my class have agreed because they were caught consulting handhelds and other devices during their games. It's a big problem. It's a big problem also when the clicker decides to pause. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Well, um, um, pause. That's the operative word. What about those not caught yet? Okay. That's where I've been called in. The moves of every game are recorded and turned in like a golfer's scorecard and many events broadcast all or some of their games online. Can one detect a digital agent in the patterns of moves and do so with confidence? Now, I can't just say, you played too well. That would be lame, like saying, Mr. Armstrong, I don't think you can bicycle that fast. In order to substantiate what many are already calling e-doping, one needs objective elements in specific tests that stand apart from raw performance. And anything apart from raw performance is a matter of cognitive style. Computers not only play better, they play different. So I use computer programs themselves to fight fire with fire. Well, there is a program called Fire that was mentioned in the cheating case in 2011, but so far I've mostly used a program called Ribka. Together with Ribka and other programs, I've built up some pretty big data to find the patterns. I've analyzed over half a million games, over three million moves, all from 30 million moves, all from real competition, not simulations. I've amassed over 100 million pages of data without needing a single human subject's waiver. This consists of almost the entire history of top-level human chess and top-level computer chess. The data and my model reveal patterns not just for cheating and maybe not just for chess. Okay. Choosing which of five plausible moves to play is like choosing which of five bubbles to fill on a multiple-choice test question. Say you get 80 of 100 questions right. Is that a B? Well, if the test is hard, maybe it should be an A. People curve and recenter tests all the time. And with massive online courses nowadays, there is much new territory. 
But in chess, the standards of mastery have been known and rock solid for decades. And I aim to leverage patterns and results I find in chess to take them back to testing. Well, how did this all begin for me? For me, it all began during the toilet gate scandal in the 2006 World Championship match between Kramnik and Veselin Topalov of Bulgaria. As an international master, I had commentary privileges on a big server run by the makers of the program Fritz 9. I was online with over 5,000 people when Topalov's manager released a letter at the halfway point of the match accusing Kramnik of cheating via computer table to his toilet, which was the only part of the match arena that was off camera. The co-founder of the company making Fritz 9 went on the same chat line and asked for help how to evaluate this kind of statistical accusation. As a qualified scientist, I felt responsible to act, and I did, staying up late with the baseball playoffs. I half reproduced the figures in the letter, really only in the gut-wrenching game two when Topalov played a brilliant attack but muffed it and lost. However, in that game, I also found a reason for Kramnik's high agreement. Topalov had forced his hand, often leaving him only one real option per move. And this led to the main qualitative principle that still underlies my model. When there is only one way to stay afloat or stay ahead, chances are a good player and a computer will both find it. So the agreement is less significant. Now, will computers force our hands like that? We'll come to that question, but first to finish my story. I had my data and conclusions all set on Thursday, October 12, 2006, the day before the last day of the match on Friday the 13th. I was all set to go on that server at 7 a.m. Eastern to announce my finding, denounce the accusation I was loaded for bear. But what happened eight years ago this week? The 2006 Buffalo <laughs> October storm. Okay, that's my, my house. That's a big branch just missing our wires and basketball hoop. Okay, the front page of the Friday Buffalo News was the devastation on Maynard Drive, just five houses up from us. Okay, instead of regaling a worldwide audience, I was bailing basements and praying no one got electrocuted. Well, on Monday, we got our power back earlier than most. And by that time, Kramnik had won. No harm, no foul. That ship had sailed. This gave me lots of time to make my quirk quantitative and deeper and to go into other areas of human cognition, not just cheating. And I was glad for that. For three and a half years, there were no real cases. I defended a couple of other people wrongly accused with the same principles. But alas. In January 2011 came the case I talked about with a top 100 player from France. In 2012, there were some more cases, and then came 2013. Ah, uh, two cases where there was no physical evidence, no one caught, but where my model said the chance of those moves being human was near zero. Then a player caught his teenage opponent looking at their game in the loo. Since this was Ireland, that means toilet. And he roughed him up. These and other incidents led the game's officials to act, and since 2013, I am on a joint committee of the World Chess Federation, FIDE, and the Association of Chess Professionals on all aspects of cheating. How is it possible to cheat at chess anyway? How would you do it, Sam I am? Would you use a hidden cam? Well, some have tried it in a hat or based on chairs where people sat. One got buzzes on his thigh, others read texts on the sly. Some had helpers incognito. One was caught with a phonito. One got signs from daddy's hands. There's talk of LCD wristbands and the new Apple iWatch and Google Glass, contact lenses, 
cognitive implants? Oh, no. <laughs> well, cheating aside, what can we learn? The procedural grounds upon which my model is based is separating skill assessment from prediction. The skill assessment part is a metric I call your intrinsic performance rating, which is not part of the cheating test. It is based just on the quality of your moves, not the results of games. Luck from your opponent's play not involved. The prediction part uses mathematics similar to risk assessment and fraud detention in predictive analytics. Together, these reveal natural human tendencies and natural computer tendencies. I'll give four examples from my research. First and most basic, computers blunder less often than we do. I can give a particularly graphic presentation of this. First, your chances of winning when you're ahead are greater than when you're behind. If you're a pawn ahead, 100 center pawns, your chances are 70%. If the game is even, 50%. But if you are 150 points higher rated than your opponent, the curve shifts up as if you have an extra pawn in your pocket. Now, given this, given the value of your position, would you prefer to be your move or your opponent's move? Well, naturally, we would prefer it to be our move. But this graph shows that people whose time it was to move all across the spectrum of value had 2 or 3% worse results than when it was the opponent's turn to move, while for computers, the effect is absent. The cynical reason is that when it's your move, you have the first opportunity to make a big blunder, okay. whereas computers don't. Second. Games have, human games have a time budget of, for usually the first 40 moves. Players often spend most of that budget by move 30, leading to frantic time pressure and error ramping up until the time is refreshed. Computers have wiser time management algorithms. This bottom curve shows this happens even when I correct for a phenomenon that I'll describe next, which was the most surprising one that I found. Okay. And this is that humans make more error when we're ahead as well as when we're behind compared to when the game is even, while computers, the pink line, don't. Now, I'd expected this when players were way behind or way ahead. They might play like prevent defense in football, but the effect shows clear down to zero. The curve says that when you're half a point ahead, you're playing twice as badly. Well, shouldn't your killer instinct be kicking in then? What's going on? My explanation is that humans perceive differences in proportion to the value of what's at hand. We'll drive across town to save $20, say $5 on a $20 gadget, but care less about $5 on a $100 dinner tab and little about $5 on a $1,000 appliance. This has been documented in economics, well, I think here it is, in chess. Some people thought the cause might be rational, that we play closest to the vest and the steepest part of these curves when the game is even because errors might hurt us the most. But if so, I would expect the phenomenon to shift along with these curves, and it doesn't. Thus far, we've painted a fairly expected portrait of our agents. They avoid big errors, they avoid getting rushed, and they see value equally in all situations. Now for the big question. What kind of situations do they get into? How forcing are they? The answer is significantly less. My model's agreement projection gives a measure of how forcing the position is. It is under 50% in games played by computers, but significantly over 50% in human games. The kicker comes from tournaments where humans and computers played as teams. The freestyle rules allow players to consult as many computers as they like and choose the move when computers differed. Sometimes they played a second listed move to pursue a human strategy. Was the result more human-like or computer-like? It was human-like. But was that a detriment? No. The quality was actually significantly better. Humans played and computers team, humans added 200 points to the quality, even though their own skill was much less than the programs. It took until this year to run a similar tournament, and there the results are more mixed. 
the, condition, the tournament was a marathon, the computers are better, and maybe the conditions weren't as good. At least the computers never forced as much as Topalov did on Kramnik. The difference in style may be like Star Trek. In various episodes, Kirk and McCoy want to intervene, but Spock represents the position that it is logical to cultivate multiple options. Okay. In sum, PDAs pick up every little difference, forest and the trees. They avoid our foibles of overconfidence, getting down, and, me and they help us, may help us to measure our risks. Okay? But the hopeful point is that even at a purely calculational game like chess, our brains still contribute. Well, 2014, maybe. And the main takeaway from this talk is that our PDAs should be programmed to enhance the freedom given to our brains rather than constrain it. My work says this should be natural. If we know our place and know our PDAs, this could be the beginning of a beautiful relationship. Hello. Thank you very much, Dr. Reagan. So we're going to take another short interlude with another video. And this video is a TED Talk by Joshua Klein titled The Intelligence of Crows. How many of you have seen the Alfred Hitchcock film, The Birds? Yeah. Any of you get really freaked out by that? You might want to leave now. <laughs> so uh, this is a vending machine for crows. And over the past few days, many of you have been asking me, how did you come to this? How did you get started doing this? And it started as with many great ideas, or many ideas you can't get rid of anyway, at a cocktail party. About 10 years ago, I was at a cocktail party with a friend of mine. And uh, we were sitting there, and he was complaining about the crows that he had seen that were all over his yard and making a big mess. And he was telling me that, really, we ought to try and eradicate these things. We've got to kill them, because they're making a mess. I said, that was stupid. You know, maybe we should just train them to do something useful. And he said, that was impossible. And I'm sure I'm in good company in finding that tremendously annoying when someone tells you it's impossible. So I spent the next 10 years reading about crows in my spare time. <laughs> And after 10 years of this, my wife eventually said, look, you know, you've got to do this thing you've been talking about and build the vending machine. So I did. But part of the reason that I found this interesting is that I, uh, I started noticing that we we're very aware of all the species that are going extinct on the planet as a result of human habitation expansion. And no one seems to be paying attention to all the species that are actually living, uh, that are surviving. And I'm talking specifically about synanthropic species, which are species that have adapted specifically for human ecology, species like rats and cockroaches and, co and crows. And uh, as I started looking at them, I was finding that they had hyper-adapted. They become extremely adept at living with us. And uh, in return, we just tried to kill them all the time. <laughs> and in doing so, we were breeding them for parasitism. We were giving them all sorts of um, reasons to adapt new ways. So for example, rats are incredibly responsive breeders, and cockroaches, uh, as anyone who's tried to get rid of them knows, have become really immune to the poisons that we're using. So I thought, let's build something that's mutually beneficial. Well, and let's build something that we can both benefit from and find some way to make a new relationship with these species. And so I built the vending machine. But the story of the vending machine is, is a little more interesting if you know more about crows. It turns out that crows aren't just surviving with human beings. They're actually really thriving. They're found everywhere on the planet except for the Arctic and the southern tip of South America. And in all that area, they're only rarely found breeding f more than five kilometers away from human beings. So we may not think about them, but they're always around. And not surprisingly, given the human population growth, more than half of the human population is living in cities now. And out of those, nine-tenths of the human growth population is occurring in cities. We're seeing a population boom with crows. So uh, bird counts are indicating that we might be seeing up to exponential growth in their numbers. So that's, that's no great surprise. But what was really interesting to me was to find out that the birds were adapting in a pretty unusual way. Um, and I'll give you an example of that. So this is Betty. She's a New Caledonian crow. And these crows use uh, sticks in the wild to get insects and whatnot out of pieces of wood. Here she's trying to get a piece of meat out of a tube. Um, but the researchers had a, a problem. They messed up and left just a stick of wire in there. And uh, 
she hadn't had the opportunity to do this before. You see it wasn't working very well. So she adapted. Now this is completely unprompted. She had never seen this done before. No one taught her to bend this into a hook. No one had shown her how it could happen. But she did it all on her own. So keep in mind that she's never seen this done. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. All right. <laughs> so that's the part where the researchers freak out. Um, <laughs> So it turns out we've been, we've been finding more and more that crows are really, really intelligent. Their brains are proportionate in the same proportion as uh, chimpanzee brains are. Um, there's all kinds of anecdotes for different kinds of intelligence they have. For example, in Sweden, crows will wait for fishermen to drop lines through holes in the ice. And when the fishermen move off, the crows fly down, reel up the lines, and eat the fish or the, the bait. It's pretty uh, annoying for the fishermen. Um, on an entirely different tack, at University of Washington, they, uh, a few years ago, were doing an experiment where they captured some crows on campus. Some students went out, netted some crows, uh, brought them in, and were, you know, weighed them, and measured them, and whatnot, and then let them back out again. And we're entertained to discover that for the rest of the week, these crows, whenever these particular students walked around campus, these crows would caw at them and, and run around and make, make their life kind of miserable. <laughs> they were significantly less entertained when this went on for the next week and the next month and after summer break, until they finally graduated and left campus, and glad to get away, I'm sure, came back sometime later and found that crows still remembered them. So, the moral being don't piss off crows. So, <laughs> now students at the University of Washington that are studying these crows do so with a giant wig and a big mask. <laughs> it's fairly interesting. So we know that these crows are really smart, but the more I dug into this, the more I found that they actually have a, an even more significant adaptation. Crows have become highly skilled at making a living in these new urban environments. In this Japanese city, they have devised a way of eating a food that normally they can't manage. Drop it among the traffic. The problem now is connecting the bits without getting run over. Wait for the lights to stop the traffic. Then collect your cracked nut in safety. Yeah, yeah, pretty interesting. So what's significant about this isn't that crows are using cars to crack nuts. In fact, that's, that's old hat for crows. This happened about 10 years ago in uh, a place called Sendai City at a driving school in the suburbs of Tokyo. And since that time, all the crows in the neighborhood are picking up this behavior. And now every crow within five kilometers is standing by a sidewalk waiting to collect its lunch. <laughs> so they're learning from each other, and research bears this out. Parents seem to be teaching their young. Um, they learn from their peers, they learn from their men enemies. If I have a little extra time, I'll tell you about a case of crow infidelity that illustrates that nicely. Um, the point being that they've, they've developed cultural adaptation. And as we heard yesterday, that's the Pandora's box that's getting human beings to adapt to new challenges and new resources in their environment, uh, which is really useful if you live in a city. So we know that there's lots of crows. We found out they're really smart, and we found out that they can teach each other. And when all this came clear to me, I realized the only obvious thing to do is build a vending machine. So that's what we did. This is a vending machine for crows, and it uses Skinnerian training to shape their behavior over four stages. It's pretty simple. Um, basically, what happens is that we put this out in a field or someplace where there's lots of crows, and we put coins and peanuts all around the base of the machine, and crows eventually come by and eat the peanuts and get used to the machine being there. And eventually, they eat up all the peanuts, and then they see that there are peanuts here on the feeder tray, and they hop up and help themselves. And then they leave, and the machine spits up more coins and peanuts, and life is really dandy if you're a crow. Then you can come back anytime and get yourself a peanut. So when they get really used to that, we move on to the crows coming back. Now they're used to the sound of the machine, and they keep coming back and digging out these peanuts from amongst the pile of coins that's there. And when they get really happy about this, we go ahead and stymie them, and we move to the third stage, where we only give them a coin. And like most of us who have gotten used to a good thing, this really pisses them off. So <laughs> they do what they do in nature when they're looking for something. They sweep things out of the way with their beak. And they do that here, and that knocks the coins down the slot. And when that happens, they get a peanut. 
And so this goes on for some time. The crows learn that all I have to do is show up, wait for the coin to come out, put the coin in the slot, and then they get their peanut. And when they're really good and comfortable with that, we move to the final stage in which they show up and nothing happens. And this is where we see the difference between crows and other animals. Squirrels, for example, would show up, look for the peanut, go away. Come back, look for the peanut, go away. They do this maybe half a dozen times before they get bored, and then they go off and play in traffic. <laughs> crows, on the other hand, show up and they try and figure it out. They know that this machine's been messing with them through three different stages of behavior. <laughs> They figure it's got to have more to it. So they, they poke at it and peck at it and whatnot. And eventually some crow gets a bright idea that, hey, you know, there's lots of coins lying around from the first stage, lying around on the ground. Hops down, picks it up, drops it in the slot, and then we're off to the races. That crow enjoys a temporary monopoly on peanuts until his friends figure out how to do it. And then there we go. So what's significant about this to me isn't that we can train crows to pick up peanuts. Um, mind you, there's $216 million worth of change lost every year, but I'm not sure I can depend on that ROI from crows. <laughs> Instead, I, I think we should look a little bit larger. I think that crows can be trained to do other things. For example, why not train them to pick up garbage after stadium events, or find expensive components from discarded electronics, or maybe do search and rescue. The main thing, the main point of all of this for me is that we can find mutually beneficial systems for these species. We can find ways to interact with these other species that doesn't involve exterminating them, but involves finding an equilibrium with them that's a useful balance. Thanks very much. <laughs> so, being part of TED and TEDx, it's, it's been great hearing so many great ideas. And, and today, there seems to be this big focus on collaboration, which has been great. So I figured I'd network a little bit. So I brought an 8x10 framed picture of myself, and I put my email address and my phone number on there. I've been having the darndest time trying to hang it backstage in, in the brick wall, because it's hard to pound a nail in with the bottom of the microphone. If only there was some place locally that I could borrow tools to to help me with the projects that I'm doing and projects to help with the community projects. Hey! Tools? Well, look at here. So I would like to now introduce Aaron Karlikowski and Darren Cotton, volunteers at the University Heights Tool Library. And their talk is Collaborative Construction, Putting the Sharing Economy to Work. <laughs> There's a growing phenomenon in our economy today called the sharing economy. And there are great examples of this phenomenon at work here in Western New York. But we're here today to talk to you about our neighborhood, University Heights. And it's a neighborhood where people are using the sharing economy not just to share, but also to build. And this, ladies and gentlemen, is where our story begins. This is 63 Lisbon Avenue. And no, those aren't toothpicks holding up that second story porch. Those are two by fours that my landlord hastily threw up. I use this picture sort of as a symbol of the type of disinvestment and absentee landlordism seen throughout the University Heights. Uh, but me and my roommates decided, you know, we didn't want to be a victim to this cycle, that we wanted to do something about it and make our apartment nicer. So we leaned on our parents. We raided their garages of the tools that we needed to do a lot of the work ourselves. And in the end, we were able to come up with this mutually beneficial agreement with our landlord where the money, the time, and the resources that we invested into our apartment, we could deduct from our rent. So he got a nicer property, we got a nicer home, cheaper rent, and we both won in the end. Unfortunately, these patterns of blighted properties, disinvestment, and absentee landlordism, they're all too common in University Heights. And it's the people, ourselves, our neighbors, the people who live in the community that suffer the most. These properties send a message to the community that nobody cares. At least, the person who owns that property doesn't care about their building, and they definitely don't care about the community. But rather than making a big issue out of this, we see it as an opportunity. If people like Darren and his housemates were living in 63 Lisbon, there may be other people like them living in these other blighted properties. And this is really where the Tool Library was born from. 
this need for a centralized resource in the neighborhood where people who wanted to make a difference, who wanted to see change happen, could come and gain access to the tools that they needed to make that happen without having to spend a small fortune in the process. And so working with a classmate at UB, I sat down and wrote out a business plan for the University Heights Tool Library. So to begin with, you know, what is a tool library? How does a tool library work? Where do the tools come from? And at the end of the day, what is the purpose that it serves in the community? And thanks to the support of a local council member, $15,000 in seed funding to get us off the ground, a lot of hard work, a little luck, we were able to find a vacant storefront on Main Street and turn it into the beginnings of the tool library. Now, you hear 15,000 clams and you're thinking, holy cow, that's a lot of money. But when you have things like rent and utilities and nicks and cuts insurance that you gotta cover, that $15,000 disappears really quickly. And so for the first couple months, you know, we only had three rakes on a wall. People would walk into the tool library and say, what is this? Are you trying to be a hardware store? Or is this some sort of weird public art installation? But what they were really walking into, what they were seeing, is the emergence of the sharing economy in University Heights. A tool library is like a book library, but instead of borrowing books, you borrow tools. And in University Heights, that membership only costs you $10 for the entire year. And we can proudly say now that we have a few more than just three rakes on the wall. We have over 600 tools that people have access to. And this is really what the sharing economy is all about, having access to things rather than owning them outright. Most people who come into the tool library really just need a hole in the wall. They don't need the drill itself. And really, there are other great examples of the sharing economy at work here in Western New York. People are sharing office space and office services at Cowork Buffalo on Main Street and at DIG at the innovation space at the Buffalo Niagara Medical Campus. They're also sharing bikes and cars using services like Buffalo Car Share. And then nationally and internationally, people are using and sharing rides to get from point A to point B using services like Uber and Lyft. And people are even sharing their couches, their apartments, and their houses using things like Airbnb and couch surfing. These sharing economy alternatives often come for free or at a fraction of the price that it would be otherwise. And this little fact that it saves people money means that the sharing economy isn't going anywhere anytime soon. And central to the sharing economy is this idea of collaborative consumption, or the fact that multiple users can use the same good without ever actually having to own it. And so take this stat up here. It might seem a little startling that the average power drill is only used 12 minutes over its lifetime. But really think about it. How often have you used that drill? Maybe a couple times to hang a few pictures or to put a bookshelf together? But other than that, it's just sitting there, idle, not being used. And so what collaborative consumption allows us to do is scale that 12 minutes up to 1,200 or 12,000 minutes used across hundreds of users on thousands of different projects in the community. And when we started the tool library, this was very much uh, our thought process, this one-to-one -one relationship of someone has a drill, they don't need it, so they can donate it to the tool library. Someone needs a drill and doesn't, have, doesn't own one, they can gain access to it through this centralized resource that the tool library becomes. And so it was very much focused on the individual in how can I use this tool? So the longer that we manage the tool library, the more we realized that the community was approaching the tool library from a completely different perspective. And when I say the community, I'm talking about the block groups and community associations that we have in the neighborhood. These are groups that typically form in response to neighborhood challenges or problems. And they were using the centralized tools at the tool library to help them solve those problems. We saw that when you give a tool or you share a tool with an individual, they accomplish a task that they probably would have done anyway. But when you give a group of tools to a community, they start doing things that they couldn't do before. And so it was really interesting to see this evolution of the tool library from this physical space where individuals would come to get tools for their individual projects to this social space where members of the community would come together and talk and share their hopes, their dreams, but also their frustrations for their neighborhood. And so it started to change and people, instead of walking down the street and thinking, oh, someone should really do something about that graffiti, 
it started being more, what can we as a community do about that graffiti? And the tool library provided the tools for this community-driven solution to quality of life issues. And so we saw this evolution from collaborative consumption to collaborative construction. And this is what we think is the overlooked point of the sharing economy, the ability for communities to create common visions and to realize them. An early victory for collaborative construction in University Heights is this green space that you see behind me, Linear Park. Linear Park was a place when I was an undergraduate at the University of Buffalo. It was garbage strewn, overgrown, and a great place to get mugged or assaulted on the weekends. I was constantly told this is that, a place that, that you... That wasn't a joke, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I was constantly told that this is a place that you do not go. This is dangerous. Well, one of the block clubs in the area, the Heath Street Block Club, a few years ago said, enough is enough. We're not going to take this anymore. And they got together, organized small cleanups, and started taking care of their small part of the park. Over time, other groups like the Merrimack Street Block Club and the Custer Street Block Club and the University Heights Collaborative joined in the effort. And again, the tool library sort of filled this role as a space where community members could come together and imagine what Linear Park could be, a place that they could walk their dog or ride a bike or bring their family down just to enjoy a really nice day. And it also provided the tools to allow us to scale those cleanups up from just a handful of people to 50, 60, 70 volunteers at a time. It also brought together these two populations in the Heights, students and homeowners, and they got to work together working towards this common vision of a different linear park, of a better linear park. Building off of that, uh, the University Heights Collaborative actually found out that there was over a million dollars in federal funding that the city had been sitting on for over 10 years that was earmarked for a Rails to Trails project. And we thought, well, we have all this grassroots support. What, is it, what will it take to get this project off the ground? And so, with a lot of pushing and a lot of hard work at the ground level, I'm happy to report that $1.2 million is going to be invested in Linear Park and the surrounding areas this coming spring. And it all started with a block club that had a vision. Now, <laughs> thank you. It gets now, better. <laughs> now, you heard Darren talk about how those cleanups went from a handful of people to 50, 60, or 70 volunteers at a time. And anybody out there who has ever had to manage 50 people at the same time in real time knows that it's a very difficult task. And so we took a step back, and we realized that we were using a tool that we all have access to. We were using our mobile phones to call, text, and email with our volunteers and volunteer coordinators before, during, and after any kind of service event to make sure that people knew where to show up, what to do, and when to pack it up at the end of the day. And so we, looked, we decided that we wanted to look at uh, national and international examples of how other people were using mobile phones to solve their problems. And what we found were some pretty significant examples. In 2008, Kenyan society used mobile phones to monitor post-election violence in that country. And two years later, a devastating earthquake hit Haiti in 2010. People used mobile phones to coordinate disaster response and to find survivors still trapped in the rubble. And even still today, people are using mobile phones and social media to organize themselves, particularly against autocratic governments around the world. But we began thinking more locally and thinking, how can we use mobile phones as a tool in our neighborhood to help solve some of the challenges that we face every day in the University Heights? And so the first opportunity we had to do this was with a project called Buffalo Tracks Graffiti. Uh, working with a bunch of UB students over the course of a semester, we had them go out armed nothing, with nothing more than their smartphone and actually tag instances of graffiti around the University Heights. And so our motto was, if you see graffiti, zap graffiti. And when they were zapping that graffiti, what they were actually doing is pinning a geolocated picture of that graffiti on a publicly accessible Google map. And this map didn't just hold the address and photo of where those graffiti points were. We also asked volunteers if, to answer a few simple questions on each point of graffiti. What surface is it on? How severe is the graffiti? And is it offensive? These simple points of information allowed us to effectively plan and strategically plan how best to use our limited manpower, money, and materials to mitigate the problem of graffiti in University Heights. 
But some of those surfaces, uh, particularly brick and masonry, provided a, an additional challenge in terms of removing the graffiti. So we had to think of something else. And so take, for example, this wall that we had painted probably half a dozen times. And every time, the tagger would come back and tag it again. And so we thought, well, why don't we take a different approach? Why don't we look at this building as a canvas for public art? And why don't we invite public artists to be part of this anti-graffiti initiative? And so instead of this wall being tagged again and again and again by graffiti artists, it's now tagged again and again and again on Instagram with the hashtag University Heights. And that bird has made its rounds. Now, we, have, we use this opportunity not just to remove the graffiti, but also to give the community an opportunity to help shape its identity even more. Here you have two examples of murals that were done by a local artist, Vinny Alejandro. Uh, that he worked with the community to help us identify certain elements of our community that we wanted to share. Here you have a lamppost that's at the corner of Maine and Education. University Heights is right next to a large public research institution. And on the, I think it's to your left, uh, there's a mural that's called Higher Learning in University Heights. And this helped to create a sense of place and identity for the community. The next opportunity we had to use mobile phones as a tool was with a project called Retree the District. As a community, we had noticed that tree coverage as a whole was unevenly distributed across the neighborhood. So on some streets, you'd have these beautiful tree-lined vistas, while on others, it was more of a barren moonscape. And we were wondering, what's the deal with this unevenness? How can we really bring back our urban tree canopy? And so we committed ourselves to planting a thousand trees across the university district over the next two years. But one of the caveats was we had to figure out where those thousand trees were going to go. So we went to the city of Buffalo. We knew the city had a comprehensive database of the urban tree cover in the city. But through our conversations, we learned that the city hadn't had the opportunity to update, comprehensively update that database since 2001. And for those of you who are familiar with Western New York, know that in 2006, there was a freak snowstorm that wiped out a big portion of our urban tree cover. Now, here we were, a community in 2014, and we needed to figure out where to plant those trees. And so again, we armed a uh, small army of volunteers with nothing more than their mobile phones and asked them to report on an address-by-address -address basis some very basic information, simple information. Is there a mature tree there? Is there a newly planted tree? Or was there no tree? Or was it something else, like a light pole or a fire hydrant? And this is what we found. And what we were able to do, instead of having a physical manifestation of collaborative consumption, as we saw with Linear Park, we actually had this digital manifestation of what our neighborhood looked like through the lens of tree coverage. And we crowdsourced over 2,600 points of data on this Google map. And so you really get a sense for where those tree-lined vistas are, and also where those barren moonscapes are and where the trees could eventually go. Now, a lot of people talk about big data as a solution for some of our biggest social problems, but we tend to think that there's another option in there. This small data, this tiny data, can be used to facilitate community-generated... I think that's material for another talk. Got it. But still, here, when we would scale up the data, uh, this neighborhood-level data, on a street-by-street -street basis, we were able to actually understand our neighborhood from different perspectives. Th these data tell us quite a bit about... <laughs> these data tell us quite a bit about crime and public safety in our neighborhood on a street-by-street -street basis, as well as different levels of community engagement. And so if you look at the charts up on the screen, and the one in the top right, you see there's an overwhelming amount of newly planted trees, and you might be wondering, well, what's the deal? What's, why is that street so different? And this is Minnesota Avenue, which has one of the most active block clubs in the community. And so this community engagement and this um, work of the community is actually reflected in this very localized data. Now, this is the real promise of the sharing economy. While we do recognize and appreciate that it opens up this space for collaborative consumption, we get more excited about the prospect of collaborative construction. The sharing economy allows communities to not only identify problems and develop solutions to address those problems, but it also, through technology, allows communities to set goals and measure progress toward the achievement of those goals and define what success even looks like. And as collaborative 
construction allows communities to continue to build these shared visions for the future. We think it's pretty awesome that the sharing economy also provides the tools to make those visions a reality. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much, Darren and Aaron, folks who's hungry. It's that time. So uh, to keep things as organized as possible, I'll call you out in, uh, by section. Um, so we'll start with the uh, house right section. If you guys want to head on out, um, grab some food courtesy of Lloyd. And while you're doing that, folks, I challenge you to share some ideas, share some stuff that you've heard already and, and talk. And, and maybe when you come back, Switch seats a little bit. Sit next to someone new and get a different perspective of what's going on. So we'll call the rest of you up in just a minute.
Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. As you're filtering in, I hope everyone is satisfied. Don't worry, I'm not going to make you do jumping jacks this time. I promise. Um, I hope everyone enjoyed lunch. Uh, and let's give a thank you to Lloyd for making that possible. So folks, I want to take a minute to introduce a special guest uh, that is uh, going to speak for us. Since taking office as Erie County Executive in January 2012, Mark Polenkars has worked to change the culture of Erie County government and return it to its core mission, to provide programs and services that residents and taxpayers demand as effectively and efficiently as possible. And as such, he made it a priority to restore funding for what he calls the people's mandates, which includes the rodent control program, parks improvements, road and bridge construction, libraries, summer youth programming, and renewed commitment to arts and cultural organizations. Please join me in welcoming Erie County Executive Mark Polenkars. Thanks, Jake. And welcome everyone to this beautiful Montante Center. How's the, uh, how's the program gone so far? Good? Excellent. Uh, you actually all should be commended for taking time out of your day to attend this because it shows that you care about not only advancing, hopefully yourselves in some way, but this community. Now, I was asked to come here and offer some greetings, and I just did that, so congratulations and greetings. But I, I want to, I have just a couple minutes, and I want to send a message out to each and every one of you. We know about the wonderful things that are happening in the new Buffalo, the new Erie County, the unemployment rate that dropped in about two and a half years from 8.9% to 6.1%, the 15,000 more people that are working in our community and the great things that are happening, a lot of it because of people like you. But at the same time this is going on, I want you to each think about when you walk out of here, not only how you can better yourself, but how you can better your community. Because we have, unfortunately, right now a tale of two buffaloes. It was the best of times, it was the worst of times going on in our community right now. We see it in county government because we are the prime deliverer of health and human services to the greater community. At the same time that we have this tremendous new economy, with all these jobs that are coming, we're seeing increases in poverty. We're seeing increases of individuals in our community that are in need. And the only way we're truly going to address these issues is by working as a community to fix them. And it can go through many different ways through volunteering for organizations, for creating your own business in which you actually are starting to hire people. But I say this to you because I was asked to come here and offer greetings, and I, I like doing that. And I gave a proclamation saying it's TEDx Buffalo Day in Erie County. But when I have an opportunity to speak to a group of people like you, leaders of our community, I don't want to waste that moment. Because we truly are at the precipice of wonderful things in our community. But if we leave, 40% of our population behind, we've done something wrong. And that's exactly what, unfortunately, is going on in our community right now. 40% of the children in Erie County are covered by Medicaid for their primary health care delivery in this community. And you only qualify for Medicaid if your family is at 133% of the poverty level or below. That means 40% of the children in this community who are not getting private health insurance from another area are getting it from the government and from the public because their families are barely making it by. And you can work and still qualify to be in that level. Truthfully, you could work full time in a $15 an hour job in this community and still qualify for Medicaid for your family and a family of four if you're the sole breadwinner in your family. It says a lot about what's going on and how we have to remember as a community that we only get by as a community based on how the weakest of us are doing. The city of Buffalo will only thrive as its weakest communities will. The county of Erie will only thrive, Amherst, Clarence, and these other wonderful areas, as goes the city of Buffalo. And the same goes for all of western New York because Chautauqua County, Wyoming County, Allegheny County, and the rest of them they sometimes come and go with what's going on in Erie County. So in these couple minutes I had, I hope I've sent you a message that things are wonderful and are turning around in our community, but unfortunately there's people who are being left behind. And whatever you do when you walk out of here, I hope you can better yourself, better your families, better your own life, but I also hope you'll take some time to think about how you can better your community. 
because it's going to take, as you often hear, a village to solve these issues. It takes a community to solve these problems. I do not want to look back at 10 years from now and say these were the best of times for people in Erie County, but only 30% of them. I want to be able to look back 10 years from now when I'm no longer county executive and say we did live through the good old times for everybody, and that takes a community to fix it. So I hope you'll join me in that mission. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Mr. Polenkars, and very fitting for today's themes, I think. So, our next performance, actually, uh, is by Lair Dance. Lair Dance was formed in 2007 by John Lair. It is a professional touring dance company in partnership with the UB Theater and Dance Department. And here to perform an excerpt from the 2009 premiere, Fused by Eight, is Emmanuel Naylor and Colleen Walsh.
Beautifully done, guys. It kind of kind of gets me in the mood to dance myself a little bit. I hope you'll indulge me. No, um, but our next speaker actually taught me that uh, backstage just a few minutes ago, we'll say. Um, Gayatri Subrayan is a UB graduate who moved back to Buffalo to start her own instruction of Bollywood-style dance. She is the founder and artistic director of Davy Bollywood Dance. Please welcome Gayatri Subrayan and her talk, Mixing Bollywood with an Evolving City. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Gaya Teresa Bryan. The Indian culture stems well beyond the Ganges River. You will find Indians who have migrated to various parts of the globe. Zimbabwe, England, the United States, 
in Canada. Many generations ago, my family was part of this migration. Born in South America, Guyana, and having immigrated to the United States at an early age of five, I was challenged, challenged to creep up with my traditions and culture. My connection was through Bollywood films. I was able to learn about where my ancestors were from, my traditions and culture, and most importantly, the art of Indian dance. I felt not only connected with my heart, but connected with my feet, embracing my ethnicity through Bollywood films. Bollywood. The word alone captivates audiences across the globe. To many, it is new, intriguing, and exotic. But what is Bollywood? Well, it's magical. Bollywood is filled with singing, acting, dancing, action, and drama. The typical three-hour-long movies are broken up with lots of singing and dancing to express our emotions. Sadness, happiness, anger, loss, and love. Bollywood dance consists of Bhangra, Garba, and Bharatnatyam, and that's just to name a few. In the northern region of India, in the state of Punjab, Bhangra is a folk dance filled with lots of passion, energy, and stamina. The high energy cardio dance style has vigorous gestures of the shoulders and arms, along with powerful kicks, squats, and claps. Initially, this dance was performed by the farmers to celebrate a good harvest. Now, you will see Bhangra dance at weddings, festivals, television, and dance competitions across the globe. Bhangra has truly gone international. As we make our way through India, we stop off in Gujarat. Garba is a village dance, which is heavily celebrated during the Nine Nights of Navatri, a festival dedicated to the Hindu deity Durga. It is a time filled with lots of beauty, color, and dancing. Garba dance starts off at a very slow tempo, but then the dole player, the drummer, beats on that drum and pushes the dancer to go faster and faster. Typically done in a circular formation, there's a series of steps which include spinning, clapping, and sweeping of the arms. Also, there's intricate footwork along with hand movements. Accompanying this dance is the use of dandiyas, 12-inch colorful sticks. The dancers partner up, bang the dandiyas against one another, twirl them in their hands, and use them as an extension of their arms, making it a fun-filled dance for everyone to enjoy. In the southernmost part of India, in the temples of Tamil Nadu, Bharat Natyam is an ancient traditional art form which embodies the Indian culture at its best. The Devdasians, the women who serve the temples, were the first to perform this style of dance. The Namaskaram is a traditional way to start and end the dance. It pays respect to the musicians, the stage, the higher being, the dancer's guru, and the audience. There are two main components in Bharatnatyam. Nitra, which is purely rhythmic, conveyed through the footwork and the hastas, the hand gestures. 
The second component, Abhinaya, conveyed through bodily gestures and facial expressions. Told in a storytelling manner, Bharat Natyam dancers use these components, the hand gestures, the footwork, the eye movements, and the beautiful straight lines to captivate audiences, take them to a world of wonder. Bhangra, ooh, Bharat Natyam, is a true essence of Indian dance. Although the term Bollywood dance is difficult to define, it is surprisingly recognizable. Garba, Bhangra, and Bharat Natyam play a significant role in the choreography for the film industry. Historically, the films would focus more on classical and folk dance. But as times changed, we saw choreographers mixing disco, hip hop, and other ethnic forms of dance into their routines. Even the once playful love songs of the past took on more technical sets of choreography, which could be related to contemporary and modern dance. Bollywood has taken America by storm. We see it on television, so you think you can dance and America's got talent. There are a number of pop icons who have fallen under the Bollywood spell. Singers like Britney Spears and Selena Gomez who fuse their music to the Bollywood beats. Even the popular song, Jai Ho from Slumdog Millionaire has an American version. So how can we mix Bollywood into Western New York? How can we take something that's been happening for so many years and build it into our community. Being a part of this community, seeing it grow, develop, and it's yearning for more culture and more art, we have an opportunity. We have an opportunity to teach and expose those who are unfamiliar with the culture, who are just learning about the culture, and those who have fallen in love with it over the years. Two and a half years ago, I moved from New York City to Buffalo, and I was in search of Bollywood dance classes. Unfortunately, the teachings and experiences that I received in New York were unavailable here. But there was an interest, a really big interest, an interest in the dance style, in the music, in the culture. Having the opportunity to bring Bollywood to Buffalo, to connect with the community, the community members, individuals of all ages, from all backgrounds, advanced dancers, non-dancers, enthusiasts of Bollywood films, to those who just use dance as an outlet has been an extraordinary chapter in my life. Bollywood has cast a spell on me. Through it, I was able to find out where I came from, who I am, and who I want to be. I leave you with this, a quote by me. I believe dance became my means of identity, giving me the opportunity to showcase my uniqueness and my culture. Through dance, I am able to share my passion with those around me and connect with my past, my present, and my future. My name is Gayatri Sobrian. Thank you very much. Namaste. Thank you, Gayatri. Dr. Michael Kropp is president and CEO of Independent Health. Throughout the national health care reform debate, Dr. Kropp has been requested and sought after by local and national officials, including White House officials and U.S. Senators, to give advice on how to improve the national health care system. Dr. Kropp has been elected to prominent national health care industry boards, 
and is chairman of the Alliance of the Community Health, the Community Health Plans. Dr. Kropp is a board certified family physician and understands the diverse components of effective health care delivery and the critical role the health of our population plays in our national and local economy. With the goal of creating a culture of health in our region, he has helped establish many community initiatives and partnerships with providers to improve access, quality, and affordability of health care. I now introduce you to President of Independent Health, Dr. Michael Kropp, and his talk, A Culture of Health Puts Communities in Motion. Thank you. Be a trick to manage three things with two hands. <clears throat> anyway, thank you to TEDx Buffalo team for the opportunity to come and talk about how healthcare, or more specifically health, relates to a community in motion. Now, all of us have had experience in one way or another with healthcare and the healthcare system, uh, whether it's the challenge of finding a primary care physician or dealing with a, a sick parent the challenge of managing the system <clears throat> is something that we've all experienced one way or another. But today, I really want to talk about the elephant in the room as it relates to healthcare. Because we all understand that healthcare is expensive, but I think it's important to understand how expensive it is, what the opportunity costs are, and what we can do about this. So to put a little context around this, this is a chart that uh, reflects data collected by a company called Milliman. They're a healthcare consulting firm, and they track healthcare costs around the country. <clears throat> this chart reflects uh, the cost of healthcare for an average American family of four with historical data from 2004 to 2013. And when I say the total cost of healthcare, what they're calculating is uh, the amount that an employer contributes to a premium for an employee, the amount that the employee contributes to the premium, and then whatever might be incurred as a cost at the point of service uh, by any one of those family members. So it's the total cost out of pocket for health care for this average American family. You can see <clears throat> that the growth rate from 2004 to 2013 exceeds 7 percent. And if you extrapolate that forward at even lower growth rates than that 7 percent, when you get out to 2023, it comes to either $30,000 or $40,000. Now, you need to look at the red line across the top, and the red line across the top of this chart is the median household income for an average American family of four. Again, historical from 2004 to 2013, but extrapolated forward at the growth rate <clears throat> into 2023, what you can see is that health care could consume between a half and two-thirds of the average American family's income by 2023. So <clears throat> that elephant just got bigger. And it's a symbolic because the costs of healthcare are beginning to take on a significant impact in terms of the cost of doing business. Healthcare is a cost of doing business. And now it's getting to the point where healthcare is after labor, the second largest cost of doing business. So the communities that get health care right are going to be the economic winners going forward. Corporations are beginning to notice this, and they're starting to take a look at where they want to site their next business, and it has to do with communities that get health care right. Because the costs of health care are beginning to crowd out not just individual families, choice of where they want to spend their money, but they're beginning to crowd out investments in social good that communities can make in education, infrastructure, and other entities that, that could be invested in. So um, you wonder, um, you've heard the expression, how do you eat an elephant? One bite at a time. If we're going to begin to address this issue successfully, we need to understand a few facts about what's going on in healthcare. And the first fact I want you to understand is that about 30% of the $2.7 trillion that the America, US spends on healthcare today is dedicated to services that don't add value for the individual receiving those services. 
Now, it could be something as simple as a repeat test because the doctor seeing the patient didn't have the results of the test that was done by another doctor, or it could be something that's actually been proven in the scientific literature to be harmful, that the patient is, not, the patient is worse off after the intervention than they were before. <clears throat> Another fact, when something's been proven in the medical literature to be effective, it's only provided to the patient who needs it 50% of the time. Half the time, missed opportunities to make a difference in preventing a disease, screening for a cancer, or managing a condition more effectively. Third fact, the amount of money that is spent in Medicare at the end of life, taking care of people in critical care or other situations who, if they had the opportunity to act out their own wishes, wouldn't be being treated in that way, is astronomical. But the most important fact that we need to talk about today <clears throat> is that of the $2.7 trillion we spend on health care today, about 70% of those dollars go to treating chronic diseases such as heart disease, diabetes, hypertension, certain cancers. These chronic diseases that relate back to personal choices about behaviors that we make, behaviors that we exhibit. Behaviors such as whether or not we exercise, what we eat, whether or not we smoke, how much and if we drink, how we handle stress. These personal decisions and these behaviors are the single biggest determinant of the costs of healthcare in this country today. So knowing those facts and knowing that the federal healthcare reform bill sets the table for begin, beginning to manage healthcare differently, recognizing that there are healthcare system investments being made in paying physicians and other providers differently and creating more integrated and aligned care to help the systems become more efficient. The 70% issue is the biggest issue that we have to confront as a society. And the communities that get that 70% issue right are going to be not only the healthcare winners, but the economic winners going forward. So how do you begin uh, to bite, take that first bite out of the elephant and begin uh, to address this issue? Well, there's a great book out there that was written by Kerry Patterson and some colleagues called Influencer. And Influencer looks at decades of social science research around creating broad, sustainable social change. Whether it's change related to the eradication of guinea worms in Africa or change that's related to reducing the recidivism rate for criminals in the San Francisco area, change that is substantial and sustainable can all be addressed through a very interesting model that understands that there are six major influences of behaviors. And by going through this model and this framework, you can identify certain vital behaviors which then can be addressed, which can lead to significant sustainable results. So as a community, if we want to address that 70% issue, this is a wonderful framework to begin to look at. And in fact, in Buffalo, we've already begun to act out this framework with some significant results already to show. The framework, relatively straightforward, relatively simple. The six influences relate to motivation and ability. And if you think about impacting motivation and ability on a personal level, a social level, and a structural level, the ability to reach a significant portion of the population and create that sustainable change is greatly enhanced by addressing four out of these six sources of influence. The social science research shows if you can address four of these, the likelihood that you're going to have a sustainable change is greatly increased. So let's talk about what's going on here in Buffalo. On the personal motivation side, at Independent Health, we've had the interesting opportunity to introduce a new benefit that actually rewards people for making better choices about what they eat. Working with TOPS, we have a nutrition benefit that gives people a dollar 
credit for every $2 that they spend on fresh fruits and vegetables. And the uptake of that has been really incredible and exciting. On the personal ability side, we heard earlier about a soccer coach, from a soccer coach, we have been involved in this program, the Soccer for Success program, with a grant from the USA Soccer Foundation, where up to 20 schools in the city of Buffalo have programs after school where these kids are being taught not just the skills of playing soccer, which they can sustain over a lifetime because it just takes a ball and a field to be able to play soccer, not a hockey rink and a $200 stick. But they're also being taught about nutrition and the importance of fitness and how to work together to change their behaviors. On the social level for motivation, we just started a program recently with the Buffalo Bills. The Bills have, through the NFL, been working with their NFL Play 60 to reach a significant number of kids in the community. We at the Independent Health Foundation have similarly been working on a Fit Kids program, and together we're going to be reaching nearly 80,000 kids in Western New York to engage them in more consistent physical activity, more consistent nutritional behaviors and habits that will lead to health. And the great thing is that we've already begun to see how these kids will not only change their own behaviors, but just like happened in the 60s and 70s with smoking, they go home and they influence their parents too. So this wellness challenge that we're doing with the Bills goes beyond the kids that we're already addressing. It's taking it to a larger scale to reach adults through the kids as well. On the social ability front, there are investments that are going on across the community, not just through Independent Health and the Independent Health Branch YMCA out in Williamsville, but the YMCAs, the Boys and Girls Clubs across the community, and events like the Fitness in the Park where there's yoga, there are other individual trainers who can help people as groups learn how to do safe, simple exercises. And in this instance, we're talking about things that are easy to do, things that are all attainable for all of us. Because when we talk about the changes that need to take place, we're not talking about creating triathletes. We're not talking about creating vegans. We're talking about simple changes that can be made. In fact, there was a study done <clears throat> by the folks at Kaiser, um, a health organization um, that's largely in the West Coast, but they've been around for 75 plus years and they've looked at their membership. And one of the things that they found is that just 30 minutes of exercise five times a week makes a huge difference in the health of the individuals. It can reduce the incidence of type 2 diabetes by over half. It can reduce the risk of stroke by 25%. And we're talking about walking 30 minutes five times a week. We all know the impact of nutrition in terms of weight, in terms of fitness, but our ability to be able to just eat five fruits or vegetables a day can also help us with our strength, our endurance, our concentration, in addition to our health. So we're not talking about huge changes here. When we move on to the structural uh, motivation, we're talking about design of rewards and incentives. You know, I think the governor's done a really interesting job with his economic development program here, and we're seeing it work in Western New York, where there's an incentive for us to do more of the right things to build health capacity, to build infrastructure that's going to enable business going forward. And then on the last dimension, structural ability. What is it that we can do to change the environment? Well, we're seeing a lot that's going on here <clears throat> in Western New York. Here's some pictures of an event that Go Bike Buffalo helped to arrange with the assistance of the City of Buffalo and the New York State Transportation Department and the second weekend in June. It was a biking event over the sky ride that in short order, with the cooperation of Go Bike Buffalo, the city and the state transportation department, we got to shut down the Skyway and attract nearly a thousand riders to come out on a beautiful Saturday, ride the Skyway, see the city, and really enjoy themselves. So the city, in terms of creating some structural changes, is enabling more bike safety 
streets throughout the city. They can also do things like in legislation that enables community gardens like the Massachusetts Avenue Project to occur more often around the city. Employers can do things on the structural front to put walk stations into work to help people do physical activity at work while they're actually working. So these six levers are all there, and they're all there for the taking. Now, why is this so important? Why do I get excited about this? Why do I talk about it? Well, it's not something that is capturing the interest of just the healthcare industry now. Governments, corporations, foundations are all taking an active interest in this. This map is a map that shows some results of a study done by the Commonwealth Fund a couple of years ago. The country's divided up into 306 areas for Medicaid, Medicare purposes, and the Commonwealth Fund went out and ranked from 1 to 306 the areas across the country in terms of the affordability and the quality of health care. And what was interesting is that there was a strong correlation between poverty and a poor score. So when Buffalo came out, number 54, in the top quintile in the country, they said, whoa, there's something interesting going on there because we know Buffalo is a relatively poor city, but they're bucking the trend. So they actually came and they did an in-depth report. We're one of three communities across the country that they came to study. And what they found was absolutely fascinating in terms of the spirit of collaboration, the spirit of community, the can-do attitude that is going on in this community around health and health care going forward. So one of the things that I want people to take away from this conversation is that that elephant in the room, the conversation really should not be about health care. The conversation should be about health. And when we think about the six areas of influence, and we think about what's attainable, what's doable, all of us can do something. And then lastly, the more that all of us do, the more we play a role, whether it's you as an individual, making a commitment to exercise more, to eat better, whether it's you as a member of a church group that's going to make a commitment to your neighborhood and your church and do something, whether it's you as an employer, we can all do something. And we all need to do something because the more of us that do something, the more likely it is that we're going to change that map. And Buffalo can go from 54 to number one and become an even more desirable place to live, to play, to have fun, and for corporations to want to come to because we've got not just health care, but we've got health right. So I encourage all of you, think about what you can do, get out there and do it, and the more that we and our colleagues do it, the more likely we're going to change this map. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Krupp. And now we're going to switch pace a little bit and watch another video. And this one is a video by Lindsay Pollock titled Carrot Clarinet. Good morning. A lot of people here it must be because I'm wearing my red shirt. <laughs> um, I brought a carrot and I'm going to give you a quick four minute and 43, four minute and 42 instruction on how to make your own clarinet from a carrot. Um, a really good um, definition that I like of creativity is the putting together of two previously unrelated things, could be objects or ideas, and creating something new. So I'm going to take a carrot and a saxophone mouthpiece, and I'm going to give you a very quick demonstration on how to make your own instrument, because I think the thing we forget is we tend crazy because music is such a communal activity, but we tend to leave music in the hands of the experts 
and we all of us consume music, but you yourselves can become carrot clarinet players very easily. So you need a kitchen knife. I'm going to cut off the end of the carrot. And I do have my trusty carrot clarinet measuring stick here, which is giving me all my measurements. But um, you can actually go to YouTube. I've put all the measurements up on YouTube. You just need to type in, make your own carrot clarinet. <laughs> so there's my um, markings for six finger holes down the front. So I'm just using the tip of this 12 millimetre bit. So I'm giving you some, you don't even have to go to YouTube to see. You've got, just remember that you can, you can make a mark in your app. Okay, so that's six finger holes and one thumb hole on the back marking. Okay, now the tricky part. Okay, here we go. I've got a, a bowl here so I don't make too much of a mess of this stage. And into the centre. Halfway through. One more, I reckon. <laughs> Seven mil bit now. So that's for the finger holes. Let's do the thumb hole first. And now the six finger holes that you know, notice that I've marked. So um, you do need, I'm actually using a saxophone mouthpiece I mentioned, but it still is a clarinet because it's a cylindrical bore, not conical. Oh, sorry, we've run out of time. I'll have to go. <laughs> I've got 57 seconds left. Here we go. Very cool what you can do with the unexpected, right? So I was thinking after the event today, I'm gonna hold auditions for four other people. We can go down to Lexington Co-op, pick out some good produce, and we'll have our own vegetable wind quintet. It'll be great. And then after our performances, we can have a salad. <laughs> Clinton Parker is a transplant to Buffalo from Westfield, New York. 
He's lived at the Nickel City Housing Co-op for over four years and has sat on the boards of local and national cooperatives. Currently, he's working to grow the cooperative movement of Buffalo across sectors through an initiative to start a worker cooperative incubator, giving workshops on the cooperative model and encouraging businesses to convert to worker cooperatives. Please welcome our next speaker, Clinton Parker, and his talk, Democracy on Every Corner, Cooperatives in Buffalo. All right, let's see. So, could everyone please raise your hand if you have access to banking services? If you have a checking account, savings account, one of those weird direct deposit cards? Okay, now keep your hand up if you do your banking at a credit union. Okay, now keep your hand up if you already knew that that meant you were a member owner of a cooperative business. All right, so it's a decent number of you, but there's a lot of people who don't even realize it. There's a, a slew of people who are members of cooperatives who don't even realize it. So if you'll allow me to start at the beginning. Buffalo has a proud history of industry. For a time, this city was at the forefront of manufacturing in the country, if not the world. We made more steel than any other city. We had a robust and diverse base of products that were made in Buffalo, which included cars, trains, boats, planes, beer, cereal, bicycles, chemicals, clothing, candy, and so on. But the part of that story that wasn't told, however, is the fact that the manufacturing might of Buffalo was never controlled by the people who lived here. Lackawanna Steel, the company that would eventually become Buffalo's flagship of industry, Bethlehem Steel, was intentionally organized from the very beginning so that only 5 to 10% of the investors were actually from the local area. And that's not a particularly unique story. <clears throat> Those businesses that were started by Buffalonians would eventually be bought up by larger national firms. And even the boom years of wartime were nitpicking and micromanaged by the federal government. Additionally, the story of De Buffalo's decline as a, as a city is one of repeated decisions made by those in power with no regard for the voices of or the impact on the people living in the communities that they were working in as urban renewal project after urban renewal project tore down established, vibrant communities. And when you destroy a community, you aren't just relocating people. You're tearing apart the connections between them, dissolving the relationships that come from walking next door to borrow that proverbial cup of sugar, and the concern that makes people watch out for each other. <clears throat> this should sound familiar to people all over the United States, especially in other Rust Belt cities, as the repercussions of legal and financial policies put in place by government and banks have continued to play out, blighting neighborhoods and segregating entire cities. <clears throat> now, there have been a few glimmers of hope, however. Neighborhoods have been able to stand their ground, and people have been in it together to weather out financial depression. These have been the times when people have leaned on each other and worked together from the ground up. To quote Out of the Pit, a book on starting low-income food co-ops, cooperation is timelessly a part of human nature, an impulse that rises whenever, <clears throat> whenever a task looms to too large for an individual or a powerless group. Hence the phrase, many hands make light work. I've lived at the Nickel City Housing Cooperative for almost five years now. It's on the corner of Elmwood and North. It's a three-story mansion with a lived-in basement I share with 13 other people. And before you ask, we have four bathrooms, three of them have showers, one of those is a bathtub. It's fine. <clears throat> I've cooked a lot of gigantic dinners, and I've been through a lot of meetings. And there's basically two reasons I continue to live there. The first is that I have something of a superhero complex. I want to save the world. And for those of you who insist that that's impossible, I'll settle for saving as many people as possible. And I continue to believe that by living in community and bringing democracy directly into the home, we can make the world a better place in very real ways. The other reason I want to live there is that there are these times when it just feels perfect. There are these moments when there are people in the kitchen talking, laughing, singing, dancing, my dog is playing with my housemate's dog, and there are these robust and delectable scents wafting through the air. Time stands still and it makes all the dirty dishes worth it. <clears throat> it's like the best parts of Thanksgiving dinner, except for that it occurs on a regular basis and without warning. <clears throat> There's the saying, it takes a village to raise a child. It's been actually referenced a number of times tonight. Well, I have the better part of a village living in my house. <clears throat> now, the cooperative model is a way of formalizing that concept of interdependence. Whereas the common understanding of a cooperative is probably the grocery store with the 30 different varieties of granola, 
or the house on the corner where the fire spinners eat almost exclusively tofu. What a cooperative truly is, is any enterprise where the people who have a stake in the game, for example, the consumers of a good or service, or the employees of a business, also have ownership and control over that enterprise. This obviously differs from a sole proprietorship where the boss owns and controls everything, as you can see behind me, or an investor-owned corporation where the employees have no ownership and very few options for any kind of control. You could think of it as kind of a combination of the agency and representation that people are supposed to have in a democratic society, combined with the focus of working in a specific business, sort of a best of both worlds of public and private sector. And co-ops have a hidden history in Buffalo. The first co-op in Buffalo was a grocery store started on the east side by African Americans during the Great Depression. <clears throat> and this is a scan of the Buffalo Rainy Day Sun, a community newspaper that ran for 14 months in Buffalo starting in 1973. The Rainy Day Sun touched on a lot of different radical topics, but it specifically had a section that always covered news pertinent to the co-op community. There was even a conference in Buffalo about cooperatives that the Rainy Day Sun documented. <clears throat> and co-ops are making a comeback in Buffalo. There are already a number of them that are already open, ready for business. Bread Hive, a worker-owned bakery on Buffalo's west side, just hired their first new part-time employee a few weeks ago. Their co-ops are gearing up for expansion. My house, the Nickel City Housing Cooperative, is thinking about expanding into a third building. And there are a slew of people in the formative stages of starting new co-ops. A vertical farm, a weatherization co company, a construction company, a student-run tutoring organization, just to name a few. And we as, an org as a movement are working together to try and reach out and work on these other projects by organizing annual mixers or starting a think tank to bolster the movement and each other's projects. <clears throat> It's really, really great because we have these people who have been working in the movement for decades right alongside people who just stumbled out of the snowstorm because they heard about this weird communal house. Um, I was at the grand opening party for Bread Hive, and there came a point in the night where the person I had carpooled with was ready to go, but I had found myself in the middle of a conversation with one of the people who started the Buffalo Cooperative Federal Credit Union years and years ago. And I had such a look of uncontainable glee on my face that it was apparently impossible for them to pull me out of it. They couldn't couldn't bear the thought. So we didn't leave the party for a while after that. <clears throat> and this is important for Buffalo because a company controlled by the workers is probably not going to destroy the community that it came from. And it definitely won't ship its business overseas putting itself out of work. By comparison, Buffalo's soil is so laden with heavy metals it's dangerous to grow your own vegetables. And you can't eat the fish in the water, which is debilitating for Buffalo's growing refugee population, which for some groups, fish is an important cultural food staple. It's like, give a man a fish, and he can eat for a day. Teach a man to fish, his whole family gets stomach cancer. It's terrible. <laughs> Additionally, the concept of interdependence, both formally and informally, has been an important but little known aspect of the struggle of African Americans since the first arrival of slaves in America. It started with sim things as simple as pooling together what little money they could scrape up to buy each other's freedom one at a time. And it grew into things like starting food cooperatives and worker-owned businesses, like the Freedom Quilting Bee in Alabama, which gave them stable income and dignified work. Civil rights activists over the years have written and talked about the importance of cooperatives, such as Fannie Lou Hamer, Ella Jo Baker, A. Philip Randolph, <clears throat> and many more. And this is important for Buffalo, as it's become one of the most segregated cities in the country. For those of you who aren't familiar with this image, this is from a study put on by a couple of professors out of Brown and Florida University. And the different colored dots represent the different colored racial identities uh, identified by people who filled out 2010 census data. As you can see, there's some very clear and distinct lines where the colors do not overlap. And that's not OK. Um, but now, for, uh, after having done something so serious, something a little bit more lighthearted, the movie Dragonheart came out when I was six years old. <clears throat> This was a time when it was still culturally acceptable for me to be as excited about co uh, dragons as I am and always will be. Without being told, every member of my family knew for a fact that I wanted to see this movie. And many of them wanted to be the one to take me to go see the movie that was sure to be my favorite movie for years and years to come. However, my excitement was so intense that apparently all of them assumed that I had already been taken or was going to be taken by somebody to the point that I never actually got to see the movie in theaters. <clears throat> it's like the nerdiest version of the most popular girl in school not having a date to prom cliche. <clears throat> now, there's a scene in the movie where the character played by Dennis Quaid, Bowen, a knight who's become more obsessed with revenge and money, is reunited with his code of ethics, his, his code of honor. 
And there's some good stuff in there. Defend the defenseless, uphold the weak, undo the wicked. That scene's always been really important to me. Again, the hero obsession. And I've wanted a code of honor of my own. Now, the cooperative movement, any cooperative business, has at its core a set of seven principles called the Rochdale Principles, named after a cooperative group that started in Rochdale, United Kingdom, 1840s. Um, and these principles work together synergistically to create an intentional and conscientious organization, which is really great. But then there's also these really great components that come out of each individual, individual principle, such as open and voluntary membership. It means you can't bar somebody from being a member of a cooperative based on any demographic that they belong to. So cooperatives have an inherent potential as a tool for anti-discrimination and empowerment of traditionally marginalized groups. Or number five, education, which doesn't necessarily pertain to getting a BA in business, though that would work. It also talks about any kind of non-traditional concepts of education, such as conflict resolution through restorative justice or consensus-based decision-making, eldership. I can't even think of all the things that I've learned in my time, very brief as it is, in cooperatives. And cooperatives in the past have seen that when they train their own members for leadership roles within the business, those leadership skills readily and often do translate over into the civic and political arena. So in this way, you can see how the model has a potential for keep building a deeper understanding and engagement with the democratic process, especially when you take in mind how widespread the, ap the, model <coughs> widespread the application for the model is. All over the world, there are examples of cooperatives. Not just grocery and housing, but manufacturing. <clears throat> what kind of manufacturing, you ask? Let's see, we've got doors and windows, textiles, kitchen appliances, beer, bread, coffee, solar panels, there's a bunch more like that. Uh, there's cooperatives that do clerical services, funerary, childcare. There's co-op apartment buildings, social services, exotic dancing, uh, bookstores. Buffalo's Talking Leaves bookstore actually used to be, at its inception, worker-owned business. Fun fact, uh, farming cooperatives, utilities, website hosting, thrift stores, uh, book publishing, a co-op record label. There's a few examples of that. Um, so the list kind of just keeps going on like that. Um, <clears throat> but with that diversity of my application in mind, I want to talk to you again about the rainy day sun. So there's this piece in one of the old issues of the rainy day sun where the author talks about walking down the street and imagining having a cooperative business of some kind or another on every corner of the street. It was a dream of a community that was built on democratic engagement and equitable ownership. Now, obviously that dream didn't come to be. Um, cooperative businesses, as strong as they can be, can still fail. Uh, banks don't usually like lending money to dirty hippies. Um, but most importantly, Cooperatives are notoriously bad about getting the word out, hence the fact that there's so many people who are members of them without even realizing it. Um, <clears throat> but we have a second chance. Uh, the United Nations declared 2012 as, to be the International Year of Cooperatives, and they liked it so much that they went and made the first Saturday in July the Day of Cooperatives, which seems like pretty good timing, right? Democratically run businesses that are owned by the workers who just built the whole thing by pulling on their bootstraps and starting from the ground up seems like a pretty good thing to be thinking about on the fourth, right? <clears throat> so, if I've done my job right, <clears throat> you're probably sitting at the edge of your seat asking how. How can I get involved? What can I do to help? So, I'll start at the beginning. You could join a co-op. Credit union is an easy one. Or you could start a co-op. If you don't have time for that, you could help a co-op financially, either be being an investor, like a Class B investor, or just attending and promoting a fundraiser that they're having. Just five bucks to show up to the party, it's fine. But no matter what you do, there are a slew of different ways that you can get involved and help bolster the movement in Buffalo and across the world. You could learn more about the movement, the model. You could help organize a workshop, maybe help organize another conference in Buffalo on cooperatives. If you have a friend who's selling their business, maybe you could talk to them about possibly selling it to their workers as a cooperative business. But no matter what you do, please, 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 just talk about co-ops to anyone and everyone, to your family, to your friends, to your neighbors, to your students, to your teachers, to your politicians, to Facebook, Twitter, uh, make a hashtag or something, co-op everything sounds good. I've actually got a pamphlet full of resources on the back tables. It's got the little Twin Pines logo on it. 
Uh, if anybody wants to learn more, it's got books, websites, stuff you can check out. Um, but I want to leave you with this really solid quote from W.E.B. Du Bois, uh, well known as an African American writer and civil rights activist with a, you guessed it, little known passion for cooperatives of every kind. We have an opportunity here to teach industrial and cultural democracy to a world that bitterly needs it. Thank you. Thank you, Clinton. OK, guys, we have another 20-minute break. So get up, stretch your legs, grab some water, use the restrooms if you need to. And for this break, another challenge for you. This has been a very musical part of our show. So make some music, dance a little bit, have some fun, share an idea. Thanks.
Did everyone get to try the cupcakes? Pretty great, right? So we're going to ease into things a little bit, folks, and uh, we're going to go back to a couple of videos. We're going to do two back-to-back. We're going to start with Jay Silver and his talk, Hack a Banana, Make a Keyboard. And then we're going to go to uh, Adam Savage with his talk, Fabricator. Enjoy. Hey guys, um, it's funny someone just mentioned MacGyver because that was like, I loved it and like when I was seven, I taped a fork to a, a drill and I was like, hey mom, I'm going to Olive Garden and, <laughs> and it worked really well there. Um, and you know, um, it, it had a profound effect on me. It sounds silly, but like I, I thought, okay, the way the world works can be changed and it can be changed by me in these small ways and you know my relationship to you know especially human made objects which someone else said they work like this well I can say they work a different way a little bit um, and so about 20 years later I didn't realize the full effect of this but I, I went to Costa Rica and I stayed with these Guaymi natives there and they could pull leaves off of trees and make shingles out of them and they could make beds out of um, trees and they could like I watched this woman for three days I was there she, she was peeling this palm frond apart these little threads off of it and she'd roll the threads together and make little like thicker threads like strings and she would weave the the strings together and as the materiality of this exact very bag formed before my eyes over those three days the materiality of the way the world works of reality kind of started to unravel in my mind because I realized that this bag and these clothes and the trampoline you have at home and the pencil sharpener, everything you have is made out of either a tree or a rock or something that we dug out of the ground and did some process to, maybe a more complicated one, but still everything was made that way. And so I had to start studying who is it that's making these decisions? Who's making these things? How do they make them? What stops us from making them? Because this is like how reality is created. Uh, so I started right away. I was at MIT Media Lab and I was studying the maker movement and makers and creativity. And I started in nature because I saw these Guaymis doing it in nature and there just seems to be less barriers. So I went to Vermont to not back to school camp where there's unschoolers who are just kind of hanging out and willing to try anything. So I said, let's go into the woods near this stream and just put stuff together, you know, make something. I don't care, geometrical shape, just grab some junk from around you. We won't bring anything with us. And like within minutes, this is very easy for adults and teens to do. Here's a triangle that was being formed underneath a flowing stream and an, uh, the shape of an oak leaf being made by other small oak leaves being put together. A leaf tied to a stick with a blade of grass. The materiality and fleshiness and meat of the mushroom being explored by how it can hold up different objects being stuck into it. And after about 45 minutes, you get really intricate projects like leaves sorted by hue. So you get a color fade and put in a circle like a wreath. And the creator of this, you know, he said, this is fire, I call this fire, and someone asked him, how do you get those sticks to stay on that tree? And he's like, I don't know, but I can show you. And I'm like, wow, that's really amazing. He doesn't know, but he can show you. So his hands know, and his intuition knows, but sometimes what we know gets in the way of what could be, especially when it comes to human-made, human-built world. We think we already know how something works, so we can't imagine how it could work. We know how it's supposed to work, so we can't suppose all the things that could be possible. So kids don't have as hard of a time with this. And I saw in my own son, I gave him this book. You know, I'm a good hippie dad, so I'm like, okay, you're going to learn to love the moon. I'm going to give you some building blocks, and you're going to, they're non-rectilinear cactus building blocks, so it's totally legit. But, you know, he doesn't really know what to do with these. I didn't show him. And so he's like, okay, I'll just mess around with this. This is no different than the sticks are to the teens in the forest, I'm just gonna you know, try to put them in shapes and push on them and stuff. And before long, he's kind of got this like mechanism where you can almost like launch, like catapult <laughs> objects around and he en enlists us in helping him. And at this point, I'm starting to wonder, you know, like what kind of tools can we give people, especially like adults who, who know too much, so that they can see the world as malleable, so they see themselves as agents of change in their everyday lives. Because like the most advanced scientists are really just kind of like 
pushing the way the world itself works, pushing what matter can do. The most advanced artists are just pushing the medium. And any sufficiently complicated task, whether you're a cook or a carpenter or you're raising a child, like anything that's complicated, comes up with problems that aren't solved in the middle of it. And you can't get it, do a good job getting it done unless you can say, OK, well, we're just going to have to refigure this. I don't care you know, that pencils are supposed to be for writing. I'm going to use them a different way. So let me show you a little demo. This is a, a little uh, piano circuit right in here. And this is an ordinary paintbrush that I smashed it together with. Um, and so with some ketchup, And then I can kind of um, and that's awesome, right? But but this is not what's awesome. What's awesome is the what happens when you give it to the piano circuit to people. A pencil is not just a pencil. Look what it has in the middle of it. That's like a wire running down the middle. And not only is it a wire, if you take that piano circuit, you can thumbtack into the middle of a pencil. And you can lay out wire on the page, too, and get electrical current to run through it. And so you can kind of hack just like a pencil just by thumbtacking into it with a little piano electrical circuit. And the electricity runs through your body, too. And then you can take the, uh, the little piano circuit off the pencil. You can make one of these brushes um, just on the fly. All you do is connect to the bristles. And the bristles are wet, so they conduct. And the um, person's body conducts. And leather is great to paint on. And then you can start hooking to everything, even the kitchen sink. The metal in the sink is conductive. Flowing water acts like a theremin or a violin. And you can even hook to the trees. Like anything in the world is either conductive or not conductive. And you can use those together. So I took this to those same teens, because those teens are really awesome. And, and they'll try things that I won't try. I don't even have access to a facial piercing if I wanted to. And this um, young woman, she made what she called a hula looper. And as the hula hoop traveled around her body, uh, she has the circuit taped to her shirt right there. You can see her pointing to it in the picture. And every time the hula hoop would smush against her body, it would connect two little pieces of copper tape, and it would make a sound. And the next sound, and it would loop the same sounds over and over again. I ran these workshops everywhere. In Taiwan, at an art museum, this 12-year-old girl made a mushroom organ out of uh, some mushrooms that were from Taiwan and some electrical tape and hot glue. And professional designers were making artifacts with this thing strapped onto it. And uh, big companies like Intel or smaller design firms like IDEO or startups like Bump were inviting me to give workshops just to practice this idea of smashing electronics and everyday objects together. And then we came up with this idea to not just use electronics, but let's just smash computers with everyday objects and see how that goes over. And so I just want to do a quick demo. Um, so this is the Makey Makey circuit. And I'm just going to set it up like from the beginning in front of you. So I'll just plug it in. And now it's on by USB. And I'll just hook up the forward arrow. You guys are facing that way, so I'll hook it to this one. And I'll just hook up a little ground wire to it. And now, if I touch this piece of pizza, the slides that I showed you before <laughs> should go forward. And now, if I hook up this wire just by you know, connecting it to the left arrow, I'm kind of programming it by where I hook it up. Um, now I have a left arrow and a right arrow, so I should be able to go forward and backwards <laughs> and forwards and backwards. Awesome. And so we're like, we got to put a video out about this, because no one really believed that this was important or meaningful <laughs> except me and like one other guy. So we made a video to prove that you know, there's lots of stuff you can do. You can uh, kind of sketch with Play-Doh and just like Google for like game controllers. Just ordinary Play-Doh, nothing special. And you can literally draw joysticks and you know, just like find Pac-Man on your computer and then just hook it up. And you know like the, um, the little plastic drawers you can get at Target? Well, if you take those out, they hold water great. But you can totally cut your toes, so yeah, just be careful. Uh, you know the, like, the happiness project where like, the experts are setting up the piano stairs and how cool that is? Well, like, I think it's cool, but like, we should be doing that stuff ourselves. It shouldn't be a set of experts engineering the way the world works. We should all be participating in changing the way the world works together. Aluminum foil, everybody has a cat. Get a, a bowl of water. This is just photo booth on your Mac OS. Hover the mouse over the take a photo button, and you've got a little cat photo booth. 
And so we needed hundreds of people to buy this. If hundreds of people didn't buy this, we couldn't put it on the market. And so we put it up on Kickstarter, and uh, hundreds of people bought it in the first day. And then 30 days later, 11,000 people had um, backed the project. And then what the best part is, we started getting a flood of videos in of people doing crazy things with it. So this is the Star Spangled Banner by eating lunch, including drinking Listerine. And we actually sent this guy materials. We're like, we're sponsoring you, man. You're like a pro maker. OK, just wait for this one. This is good. And these guys at the Exploratorium are like playing like house plants as if they were drums. <laughs> and dads and daughters are like completing circuits in special <laughs> ways. And then this brother, like look at this diagram. See where it says sister? I love when people put humans <laughs> on the diagram. I always add humans to any, any technical, if you're drawing a technical diagram, put a human in it. And this kid is so sweet. He made this trampoline slideshow advancer for his sister so that on her birthday she could be the star of the show jumping on the trampoline to advance the slides. And this guy rounded up his dogs and he made a dog piano. <laughs> and like, you know, like, this is like fun. Um, and what could be more useful than feeling alive and fun? But it's also very serious because, uh, you know, we, all this accessibility stuff started coming up where people can't use computers necessarily. Like this dad who wrote us, his son has cerebral palsy and he can't use a normal keyboard. And so his dad, you know, couldn't necessarily afford to buy all these custom controllers. And so with the Makey Makey, he planned to make these gloves to allow him to navigate the web. Um, and the, a huge eruption of discussion around accessibility came, and we were really excited about that. We didn't plan for that at all. Uh, and then all these um, professional musicians started using it, like at Coachella, just this weekend, uh, Jurassic 5 was using this on stage. And this DJ is just from Brooklyn, right, uh, you know, right around here. Um, and he put this up last month. And I love the carrot on the turntable. Most people cannot play them that way. <laughs> and when this started to get serious, I thought, I better put a really serious warning label on the box that this comes in, because otherwise people are going to be getting this, and they're going to be turning into agents of creative change, and governments will be crumbling. And I wouldn't have told people, so I thought I better warn them. And I also put this little surprise when you open the lid of the box that says, the world is a construction kit. Okay, sorry about that, folks. Obviously, it's a little bit of technical difficulties. Um, so we're going to move right along. This summer, this is true, I made an incredible decision to rescue a dog. Thank you. There she is. Her name is Olive. Um, but in all seriousness, it breaks my heart to think what would happen if she didn't get rescued. And that brings up the question, how does one make the incredibly difficult decision to put down an animal that has less chance of getting rescued? Miranda Workman is an animal behavior specialist, an adjunct professor at Canisius Teaching Animal Learning, and a recent MSc graduate of Canisius and Anthrozoology. Through her research, she is working closely with shelters to create a better understanding of what goes into making that incredibly difficult decision. Ladies and gentlemen, Miranda Workman and her talk, Collateral Damage in the War Against Animal Homelessness.
alone. You're in a place that you've never been, and you're surrounded by individuals that you have never met. It's a bit loud, it might smell a little funny, and the environment seems thick with uncertainty and maybe a twinge of fear. You're not quite sure how to get your next meal or where you're going to be sleeping tonight. If I was going to ask you to pick which individual I'm talking about on the screen behind me, could you make a choice? And if you could make a choice, would it matter? I'm going to say to you, that choice doesn't matter because every choice that you would make matters. And the reason that every choice would matter is because we all matter. Scientists have told us that we are a lot more alike than we are different, and quite honestly, we're all playing with the same hardware, the same brains, the same nervous systems, the same chemicals coursing through our bodies that allow us to think and allow us to feel. So whether you're running a feline operating system, a canine operating system, human or otherwise, your life matters to you because you can enjoy it and you can pursue things that are pleasurable and you can suffer your life. And you can try to avoid things that might cause you harm. So if that is true that we all really do matter, we need to talk about this number. And that is the 8 million lives that end up homeless in animal shelters in the United States every single year. A good majority of those are ending up there because they're just not getting along. The dog that barks and growls at the neighbor or the cat who pees outside the litter box. Of that 8 million, 2.7 million of them, healthy and adoptable, end their life in an animal shelter. Above and beyond that number, there's another percentage of those that are deemed unhealthy and unadoptable due to significant medical and behavioral concerns. That's a lot of animals, a lot of lives that matter. So you may think that I'm starting a talk about the no-kill shelter philosophy and how do we work to save them all. And while that's a very admirable goal, that's not what I'm here to talk about today. I'm actually here to talk about euthanasia, and I'm here to talk about what goes into that choice. Because as a shelter worker myself, who is faced with this decision, it's incredibly serious. It really is an albatross to bear. Because you have to keep a lot of things in balance with those choices. Things like, can I provide for this animal's needs and maintain a quality of life while it's in our care? Is that life worth something? And how much is it worth? And then I have to keep my community at large in view because I'm also tasked with making sure that any animals that go out of my doors really are safe and stable, that they're not presenting a risk to the community. That's a lot to balance in that decision. So I started asking some questions, and that led to some research that I did as part of my master's thesis in anthrozoology. And so I started looking at who makes that choice in our animal shelters? Not only who, but how do they go about gathering information so they can make a decision to euthanize or not? And then, what information are they really looking to gather? And how is, does that influence their choice? And then, once they have it all, what ethical considerations must they keep in mind as they look at the individual in front of them and make a decision to euthanize or not? Because this is what really matters when it comes down to it. Those relationships that happen once that animal is placed on an adoption floor and finds a home. These are real people who've adopted real animals from shelters. And I simply asked on social media, can you send me some pictures of the shelter animals you've adopted that show you with your relationship with them? This is only a handful of what I got. So this is important stuff to talk about because those lives and those relationships matter. So the first question I asked was who? And when I did my survey, the results were a bit astounding and honestly a little disheartening to me. Because when I asked who is choosing life or death in an animal shelter, in my survey, over 80% of the respondents indicated that 
There were no animal behavior professionals, the people best tasked to make these choices because they understand the human and the animal behavior. Over 80% of them said that those people were not involved in these choices, especially when it's behavior-based euthanasia. They simply weren't there. That's a problem. We need to do better. We need to be demanding that our shelters put behavioral welfare first because that's really why many of these animals are at risk in the first place. So we need to be employing the right people and giving them an appropriate salary to do so, so that we are making sure the people that have the best experience are making the decisions about how to move forward with the animals in our care. And then I asked how. How do you gather information to make such a serious choice? And so I went back and looked at not only what happens in my facility, but in my research, and I found that while sometimes an owner may surrender an animal and tell you a little bit about them, you may watch them in your facility, many shelters are actually weighing very heavily the results of behavior assessments. So a series of tests that are given to animals, we see how they respond, and then we decide to move forward or not based on what happens. The problem is, are those assessments really working for us? Are they working for the animals in our care? Because I guarantee if I plopped any of you into a strange environment like I described at the beginning of this talk and asked you to behave normally, it might be a little hard to do so. And what they found is that the shelter environment is high stress. It's not the same as home. There are no relationships with the people like you would have in a home setting. And so therefore, your behavior is probably not going to be a real true reflection of who you are. And that's exactly what they found. One study actually found that of animals that had passed, so declared safe, had passed an assessment, put on the adoption floor and adopted out, just like my buddy Sherlock, who you see there, and isn't he cute? That's my boy. And he was adopted from an animal shelter, but he is a statistic. He is one of 41% of dogs who, post-adoption, within 13 months was displaying aggressive behavior. So that assessment did not identify that dog that you see on the screen. We still love him. He still has a wonderful home. But, um, but we did have some problems that we had to deal with. So the how we're gathering that information isn't really doing a good job. And so research scientists started to kind of jump on this and say, wait, what's going on here? So we started looking at what? And we're going to talk a little bit about what types of information those assessments are gathering. Are they gathering information that matters anyway? So one item that's pretty standard across most assessments is a food test. So you may or may not feed the dog overnight, hasn't had anything to eat, and then you put a bowl of food in front of it, you use a fake hand because you're hoping not to injure yourself, you approach the animal, you maybe fiddle with the food bowl a little bit, try to move it, or you touch or pet the dog and see how the dog reacts. Well, I guarantee you, if you put me in that situation with a key lime pie, you're going to see me look like that. <laughs> and that is because I'm going to do normal things to protect something important to me, my food. And dogs that growl, snarl, so showing teeth, doing those things are engaging in normal canine behavior. They're being a dog. They're using behaviors that in their language says, I, we need to change things so I don't have to hurt you. I want to prevent any harm. And yet, when we see those behaviors, our guts tense up, and we get nervous, and we killed a lot of dogs because of it. And when research scientists started looking at this particular test item, they found that dogs who had actually displayed this behavior in a shelter, of, of that group that went home, 55% still did so but 45% never displayed that behavior in a home setting. So that's potentially 45% of dogs that ended their life because they were being normal, because of an assessment that was based on a human standard, not a canine one. Now, the test did a little better the other way around. If they didn't display this in the shelter, they typically didn't at home, but we still misidentified a fifth of dogs who did display aggressive behaviors around a food bowl in a home setting. So our test, so what we're testing didn't do a good job. And then we asked people, did it really matter what the dog did? And would that affect if you took that dog home or adopted it? And most adopters said no. So we're testing for things that didn't matter in a home environment, for the most part. 
So this obviously leads us to a big problem. And that is that really when it comes to behavior-based euthanasia, we're talking about risk assessment. How likely is that individual to harm someone, specifically a human, in the future? Because we take risk to our own species way more serious than we take risk to any other non-human species. So we're looking at this. But can we really sentence an animal to die based on the fact that we think they might engage in a behavior in the future without any history that they've done so in the past? I don't know. That's an answer for you to think about. But I will say, if we're going to say yes, we need to be pretty darn certain of what our predictions are. And we need to know that we're getting them right. Because right now, a lot of animals are paying the consequences for behaviors that they've never committed yet. And we don't even govern our own species this way. And arguably, we might be the most ag aggressive species on this planet. So we really need to ask ourselves, is the collateral damage of killing good animals in animal shelters based on assessments that may not be valid, may not be reliable, have low predictive value, and are interpreted by people who don't have the expertise to really understand it, is that something that we as a community can live with? Ask yourself that question. Because you are part of this community, and your shelters are part of your community, and you need to be helping them understand what's important moving forward. So while you're talking in your mind, maybe to your neighbor, about this big idea here, what I want you to think about is this still comes back to an individual life, like Cyan. Cyan was an individual who was confiscated from an alleged dogfighting operation and was terrified of the world. He had been brought to a shelter and had been assessed. His handling assessment, his resource assessment was uneventful. He was pretty scared, so really didn't do much. But his dog-dog assessment was inconclusive at best. Now, given his previous situation, we would think that's an important piece to think about, right? Is he safe? Is he going to harm someone in the future? And do we need to end his life because of that? So this is a case study I presented in my research on my survey, and I asked, who would make the decision on this animal? Sadly, only 17% of the job titles listed by my respondents could be identified as behavior staff. And none of them listed as credentialed or having expertise in canine behavior, particularly dog-dog. And when I asked what would happen to him, 61% said maybe. That is a huge gray area to leave up to people who don't have the expertise and we're yet asking them to make this serious, very weighty decision about this animal. What would you do? Luckily, Cyan landed in a place where there was a credential behavior professional, me, and we were able to put together a plan. We were able to assess risk in pursuing that plan and then executing it. And what happened was what you see. He learned to live with other dogs, mine, and cats. He loved cats. Go figure. And he was adopted out to a family. And when I asked that family post-adoption about a year later to tell me what it meant to have Cyan in their life, they said, I can't even explain how much this dog touched my heart. That is important. Those things matter. His life mattered, and therefore the lives he touched mattered. But it's not just dogs. Cats have an even difficult, more difficult situation because there are very fewer feline behavior specialists, right? So he was picked up by some Good Samaritans, carried into the shelter, and put in a carrier, walked into the infirmary for a preliminary Medicare, medical check, and that's when I was told everything hit the fan. He was labeled aggressive, he was labeled dangerous, he was labeled unsafe. He was held for straight time by law, and then, now what? I asked that now what question in my survey. Only 20% of the job titles listed that would make the choice about his life were behavior staff, and none of them listed as any experience with feline behavior. And when I asked what would happen, 
54% indicated they weren't sure. That's a lot of uncertainty about a life that matters. Again, fortunately, Aries landed in a place where I was fortunate enough to meet him. And now, Aries is a very important part of my family. And I shudder to think what would have happened had he not landed somewhere where someone like me who can understand him as, and translate that to humans, what would happen? Where would he be? And I guarantee you, he probably wouldn't be alive. Because we did have to work hard to rehabilitate him. And as you can see now, he is a really productive member of my family. And I wouldn't have it any other way. He's awesome, isn't he? Pretty cool. Even the dogs think he's OK, too. And yes, that is Sherlock way in the back there, eyeing him up. But in the end, what we really need to think about is we're talking about in motion today. So how do we move forward? We move forward by having the right people in the right positions. That means credentialed animal behavior professionals working with shelters to make these tough choices. That means research scientists helping us understand how to improve the tools that we currently have so that we are better at predicting future behavior so we make better, safer choices for everyone involved. Because there's no other time when you need to be more certain about your choice than when it's to end a life or to save one. Because in the end, we don't all matter just because we matter to ourselves. We matter because we're important to every single life that we touch. Thank you. Thanks, Miranda. Good news. We think we have the videos up and running, so we're going to pick up where we left off with the previous one that we watched, and then we're going to continue into the second one. So let's give that a try right now. Fooled you. <laughs> Thanks for bearing with us, guys. Hi, everybody. Um, we're just going to wrap us up for the day. Sorry about those videos. Um, I hope that your day was fantastic. Um, I hope that you all mingle around with us for a couple minutes, because we are ending pretty early. Um, so if you want to meet each other, if you want to meet the organizers. Um, again, I'd like to recognize uh, the folks who made today possible. So I'd like to thank Damon Mori, the Canisius College Women's Business Center, Cinecore, Select One Search, Infotech, Babalu Ventures, Black Squirrel Distillery, Comdoc, West Her Auto Group, Fairy Cakes Cupcakery, Buffalo Business First, Block Club, Seneca Buffalo Creek Casino, Lloyd Taco Truck for the Delicious Lunch, Oogie Games, Future Self Productions, B Team Buffalo, You and Who, Canisius College. I'd like to thank the Canisius events staff and the student staff in the back. Um, also, Mark Dzelski. Thanks to President John Hurley, to County Executive Mark Polencars. And of course, thank you to all of you and the entire TEDx Buffalo Organizing Committee and our gracious team of volunteers.
And again, thank you to the TEDx uh, Buffalo team who put this all together. Um, again, those are all volunteers who put it t together this entire day. So um, definitely shout out for them. So as we wrap up, folks, uh, I hope, uh, like Adrian said, that you do share some ideas that you heard today and uh, you kind of discuss how these ideas can and have made an impact on our day-to-day -day lives. So as you leave, you'll see boxes where you can recycle your lanyards and your tag holders, and it would be a great help to us and the TED team if uh, you would be able to do that and feed those boxes appropriately. And don't forget that there is an after party today starting at 5.30 over at Buffalo Savers Grill at the Seneca Buffalo Creek Casino. And that's for all attendees, speakers, and organizers of TEDx. 21 and over, of course. Um, and that starts at 5.30, so come on and join us there, and we'll relax a little bit. And the first 100 people to arrive will have a buffet and cocktails waiting for them as well. So that's a plus. Yeah, cocktails. <laughs> and uh, one last note, we do have... Um, we do not have a shuttle, however, if you are in need of transportation uh, to the parking ramp, meet us over by the Damon Mori desk, and we have limited transportation. We'll be able to facilitate anyone who needs that. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you for joining us. Have a lovely night, and spread some ideas. <laughs>